All right, well, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Mike White. I'm the president of the UT Objectivism Society. And uh, tonight's event is being hosted by the UT Objectivism Society and the Young Conservatives of Texas UT Austin branch, both registered student organizations. This is not an event sponsored by the University of Texas at Austin. The views expressed tonight are of the invited guest speakers and do not represent the views of the university or its officers. Please be aware this event is, will be recorded and live streamed for online viewing. Uh, I would like to thank the Ayn Rand Institute for helping make this event possible. ARI fosters a growing awareness, understanding, and acceptance of Ayn Rand's philosophy objectivism in order to create a culture whose guiding principles are reason, rational self-interest, individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism. Student programs are a major focus of the Institute and include annual essay contests that award nearly $100,000 in prizes, student conferences, student club support, seasonal internships, and campus events. Visit AynRand.org to learn more. We are joined tonight by three uh, thought-provoking panelists. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, first, we have uh, Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar. Faisal is an Iraqi-born writer, satirist, computer geek, and human rights activist. Forged intellectually in Iraq during the post-9-11 US invasion, Faisal is also an advocate for secularism, human rights, and the free market of ideas. And also to add to that, a big enthusiast of the intersection of technology and advocacy, Faisal is the founder of the Global Secular Humanist Movement and Ideas Beyond Borders. Uh, thank you, Faisal. Welcome. And uh, here we have Steve Simpson. Steve is the director of, the legal, of legal studies at the Ayn Rand Institute, a former constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice. Steve regularly writes and speaks on free speech issues. He's the editor of the recent book, Defending Free Speech. Thank you, Steve. And finally, uh, moderating tonight's event is Dave Rubin. Dave is a talk show host, comedian, and TV personality. The host of the popular YouTube talk show, The Rubin Report, Dave regularly addresses big ideas such as free speech, political correctness, and religion. Thank you, Dave. And uh, you guys should check out his podcast. He's had uh, Sam Harris, Ian Hersey Ali, and Larry Elder. Here's Dave Rubin. All right. One second. Should I? Well, so there we go. Uh, well, first off, you know, I know he said that our views don't represent the university or anyone but ourselves. I, I just want to say that my views obviously represent everyone. And uh, yeah, so get on board, people, or there's going to be a lot of yelling here. Um, all right, cool. Well, thank you guys for coming out. And, and we're going to express some free speech, for which for some reason these days seems like a, uh, a feat, although it should not be. Uh, before we begin, though, uh, the university did give me uh, a list of things that we're allowed to talk about. So I just want to <laughs> quickly go through that. Just kidding. OK. Uh, all right, good. You're live. We can laugh and stuff, too. Uh, all right, so we're with two great people to, to talk about free speech. Uh, you know, it's funny. Even walking here today, you know, to get in here, there were, there were about 10 or 12 police officers here to talk about free speech. I, I'm pretty sure uh, we're not going to do a lot of hate speech here, unless you're going to shock me. Not, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Um, but somehow talking about free speech has become controversial. Uh, so the first thing that I want to kick this off to you guys, let's do something broad to start. And Faisal, I'll start with you. What do you, what do you feel about the general state of free speech in America right now? Um, it's depressing, to say the least. I mean, it's so interesting to see that a country with, uh, like, uh, which was founded on freedom of speech and stuff, um, censor itself um, in, in, um, in creating all this kind of ways to reverse authoritarianism, which I call reverse authoritarianism. Which was, it's not like the Saddam Hussein, you criticize Saddam Hussein and you go to prison. It's that people are self-censoring themselves, or sometimes the platforms like universities and, uh, by the way, this is the lighting. But, um, so I have like sensitivity to the light, so that I cry 
It's not Dave is making me crying. It's just like I have. Uh, he dealt with Saddam Hussein, people. Yeah, yeah but let's I cannot deal slack. with lies like this. <laughs> Freaking America. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I, I, so now it's like it's not like authoritarian regimes like Saddam or others like Assad in Syria is criticize taking people to jail for speaking their mind. Is the People are censoring themselves out of fear of being excommunicated, being called racist, homophobic, neo-Nazis, Nazis, all these things. Um, and there is no room for conversation. And Sam Harris wonderfully said is that we only have choice between uh, conversation and violence. And if there is no conversation to be had, then everyone is going to live in their own bubbles. And we are seeing right now the polarization in the West, in the United States at least, between far right and far left, and that everyone have their own Ten Commandments, right? So you can know someone's position on free speech from their position on abortion, which is, and their position on guns from their position on abortion. Like, it's like everyone is like following like a Ten Commandments. So I can know what the liberal thinks, or what, not this, or the liberal, but the person thinks, but I just ask him what do they think and then they, you can, they can tell you all the gospel of the left or the gospel of the right. And that means that there is hardly any room for critical thinking. And this, I mean, at least this room is being damaged a lot by all this censorship and all this fear. Um, but, and as I said, like as somebody who comes from authoritarianism, this is uh, living under authoritarian regimes, not Ali Saddam, but then after Al Qaeda and all of the basket of deplorables. Um, is, the, is that to see that happening in a country that I really appreciate and I really value. I mean, one of the reasons I immigrated to the United States is because of the values they have. And to see them spitting on these main, uh, it makes me really sad to see them just like throwing all these values like the First Amendment and, 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 and free speech in general under the bus. Yeah, well, he obviously hit a, a ton of great stuff there. Uh, and you know, we've done a few of these with the Ayn Rand folks, and I noticed that the audiences that we get are hugely diverse, not only in the way that people think diversity is, which is your color or your religion or that stuff, but diverse of thought. Uh, how many Nazis do we have here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> By, I can see one right there. That's you can good. just make a hand gesture if you want. Whatever you want to do, that, that'll be fine. Um, just make the. <laughs> oh well, now we know what the gif is going to be made of. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, so that that's a really interesting place to start because you come from a place that freedom of speech is not guaranteed. It's almost completely the reverse of that. So, Steve, as someone born here in America. Uh, that knows a bit about our laws here. Uh, I've asked you to do, we'll do a little 101 to start. Yeah. So let's just quickly, the difference between the First Amendment and the state of free speech, just so we get that out of the way, because that confuses a lot. Yeah, of sure, so uh, I mean, I think as most people know, the First Amendment basically guarantees your right to free speech, but it does so against government intervention or government censorship. So what it means essentially is the government can't censor your speech, but it doesn't mean that you're entitled to a microphone. It doesn't mean you're entitled to speak even on a college campus, although there's some exceptions to that that we can, we can talk about, about on, on public universities. Um, it ultimately means that you have the right to speak as against the government. Uh, there are limits to free speech. Now, I, I don't think of them as limits to free speech or exceptions to free speech. That's the common way to think about it. I think of it as the right to free speech has to be exercised consistently with all other rights. So rights, simply put, are rights of action. You have the right to take the, ac the actions that sustain your life. So uh, I can speak out as long as I don't use my speech in the commission of a crime. I threaten you. I incite violence. There are all kinds of ways that we can talk about if we want to. Um, now, if you distinguish that, though, broadly, more broadly from what we often think about when we think about free speech, I think about not only is it, it's obviously a right, and we need to think hard about what that right means and, and importantly what it doesn't mean, but there's a whole sort of, I would put it an ethical underpinning to what free speech is all about. What does it mean to human beings to have free speech? Uh, how important is it to people? I always think about it as freedom of speech is related uh, um, inexorably to your ability to think. And your ability to think is what makes you a human being. It, what, it's what allows you to survive in this life. If you don't have the ability to think, if you don't have the freedom to think, then you can't survive as a human being. And free speech is a kind of corollary to that. Not only do we want to think in our own minds and live in our little isolated existences, 
We want to communicate with people. That makes our lives better. Living in a society makes our lives better. And then harken back to what you uh, pointed out, Faisal, about what Sam Harris said. It's either in a society, either it is reason and persuasion on the one hand, that is we deal with each other peacefully. Maybe we, we engage with one another when we, when we want to engage with one another. We discuss things. We try to uh, reach um, uh, conclusions or, or we, we reach accommodations and, 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 and uh, discuss things and agreement. And if we can't, we walk away. That's reason and persuasion. The only alternative to that is force. And if you give up one, you get the other. And I think what we're seeing today is a move, a real serious move in this country toward the other side of that. That's what the Berkeley riots, we've had two Berkeley riots now, haven't yeah. we? It seems like every time we do one of these, there's a riot somewhere. I don't <laughs> yeah, know yeah. if there's a connection, but well, I mean, give, give them a chance. We'll see, yeah, we'll exactly. see what we can do here. Yeah. You know? So I, I, think, I can feel it. I can feel the room. I, I think I want, if I want to feel home, I should go to Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's right. <laughs> but I mean, that, so so I mean, that, you see that with the with the riots at Berkeley over uh, Milo, uh, and then uh, right after that, or not long after that, at Middlebury, Charles Murray was prevented from speaking, and then he was attacked, and another professor at, at Middlebury was attacked, and then at Claremont McKenna College, Heather McDonald was prevented from, or people were prevented from coming into the room to, uh, to see her, and then she had to be whisked away sort of in an unmarked car to an undisclosed location. And it was a real mob scene. You should watch these videos. And now, most recently, and again, we can talk a bit more about this, uh, a group of students at, at Claremont McKenna has written a letter. And I, I was telling Dave earlier, this is like right out of central casting. You couldn't write this as fiction because no one would believe it. They're opposing the universities. Uh, openness on the grounds that it harms minorities, it's a tool of oppression. I mean, they're calling free speech a tool of bigotry and oppression, which is crazy. I mean, that's a, that's a society that is moving away from reason toward what I would call tribalism. And, and it's not a mistake that we're seeing more violence as people believe more and more of that. Um, and I mean, that's a, that's a really dangerous phenomenon. Yeah, and I'm glad we started it this way because so what you have here is somebody who grew up in, in a place that did not have these rights that now sees them sort of being shaven away from us. And then as Steve laid out, we have this new thing where just we're doing it to ourselves here. So for you guys that are even here tonight, there's this idea that by, just by going to a free speech thing that somehow you're, you're doing something that, that's edgy or something. This, this, <laughs> yeah. this ain't edgy. This should not, in a normal functioning society, this should not be edgy. You know what I mean? But I know for a fact, if I busted out my phone right now and took a picture of the crowd, some of you would not want your picture taken at a free speech event. And that, that maybe, tells maybe you Maybe I should something. do that then. Yeah, <laughs> We're doing a little good cop, bad cop here. <laughs> Send it over to... Uh, so, so some of my friends in Raqqa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those who got the joke, that's very smart, by the way. Yeah. I'm proud of you, Americans. Well, these are, these are bright college kids we have here. I assume, I assume some of them are good people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let, let's talk about some of the words that, that people are using to silence free speech, because I, I'm a free speech absolutist, short of a direct call to violence. Are, are you guys with me on that? We, we don't have to be on the same page, but basically yeah. with me on that? Okay. So uh, you know, I might Should show we define it first, so for those who don't know what is the definition? I mean, free speech loses that you don't believe that there should be any restrictions of free speech unless there is a direct incitement to violence. Like sure. unless someone says, kill those black people or kill those Jews in the venue. So it's a direct incitement to violence. See, that's my understanding yeah, that, of the I mean, that's Supreme Court decision a, yeah. is that otherwise everything should be free. I yeah, mean, that's you, my you understanding bring, of free speech. You always bring speech. the Jews into this. What, what, what? It's well, built in, it's built in. Yeah, well, you know, we have a history together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so some of these words that, that people use, now you, it is your right, obviously, to use words. If you want to call someone a racist or a bigot or a homophobe or an Islamophobe, give me another buzzword. Um, Islamophobe, phobe. Uh, Islamophobe, <laughs> phobe, that's a good one. Um, but it's your right, of course, no one's stopping you from, from using those words, but those words have created the situation that I think led you guys to want to come to an event like this because what they're doing is people are defriending people. We're all being siphoned off, and partly it's, it's social media that's doing it to each other. You know, everyone on Twitter is attacking 
everybody constantly and looking to be outraged and who can we get fired from their job for uh, a nonsensical tweet. I don't know about you guys, but a little life tip for you. If you print out your at mentions at the end of the day, uh, you can use it as toilet paper, and it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. It's a little rough. It depends though, how many mentions you get, a, I guess. Yeah, uh, it little, is a little rough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What do, what do we do, how do we take the power away from those words? Because they do have power. Well, I mean, some of these words have meaning. I mean, racism is a real thing. Xenophobia is a real thing. And unfortunately, Islamophobia, except Islamophobia is a bullshit term. I mean, the rest yeah. are all true. Can, can you explain why? Because it's a technical it, reason. Yeah, because it conflates criticism of Islam as a religion and as a set of ideas with Muslims as people. And that is, I mean... You are welcome. Um, One person's with you. We should take a selfie. Um, the, so, I mean, this is what the recent Islamophobia law that was pushed in Canada that I did a podcast about is that it conflates. So, I mean, there is a difference between saying that I think that Islam has misogynistic verses or verses like I hate Muslims or I want to kill Muslims. So that's where the conflation in the term Islamophobia. So like even in the, like the mainstream definition is hatred towards Islam and Muslims. Right. So that conflates the two is that words are now violence. And that this, this kind of confusion is being made and this term is being thrown around a lot to the way that no longer it means anything, right? So to say, for example, like, uh, Mariam Namazi or Bengali bloggers or Raif Badawi, who is one of my friends from Saudi Arabia, who made some criticism of Islam, is Islamophobic, is, means he's actually advocating for killing Muslims. I mean, that's, that's what some people are interpreting that to be. Right. Um, and, also, but, and also, this stuff has become so endemic in society that I'm sure many of you saw this, but the Southern Poverty Law Center put Majid Nawaz and Ayan Hirsi Ali who I think are two of the greatest people on the planet Earth. I mean, they put them on an anti-Muslim extremist list. Yeah. So that, that's how pervasive this confusing terms purposely. Yeah, and, and if, if there's something being thrown around a lot and it gets uh, 10,000 retweets, now it's a fact, right? That's the way the world works, unfortunately. So yeah, so like how to take these words is I think that, I mean, these words, in my opinion, should continue to exist because some people are racist. I mean, I've faced some racism here and there since I came to America um, and so many other things. But my way of dealing with that racism is to challenge bad ideas with better ideas and tell them why they're full of shit. I mean, technically, <laughs> uh, technically speaking. Yeah. Um, so the, so this, is, this should be the way in which people have a conversation with each other. I mean, you cannot confront racism by silencing people. I mean, you have to have a, for the lack of a better word, I'm an atheist, but for lack of a better word, to have to have faith in people in which, like, when they have, like, t talk to you of bad ideas, you confront them with better ideas. And that's how we can change minds and, and make the world a better place. So I think the best way to, back to your question, is to, when somebody says, oh, you're a racist, I tell them, like, okay, why am I racist? Why do you think this is, and try to make them question why they believe what they believe. So if someone says, you are an Islamophobic, or you are Islamophobic, I tell them, okay, so why do you think that? And tell them, like, show me an, uh, an instance in which I advocated for violence against Muslims. And you keep, ask, you keep challenging them with, by using this word until, well, hopefully, or at least, I mean, you can challenge them and make the audience at least be, be influenced by your words or your argument towards them. So that's kind of what I'm, because sometimes some of the people that you and I know, like Reza Aslan and, and his basket of deplorables, yeah. uh, cannot be, I mean, any conversation with them is kind of impossible because they attack you immediately. But I think the audience that listens to them will probably be influenced by what you say. So that's, I think, the way to take, take power from these words. Yeah. Steve, what about the other piece of this, which is that violence is creeping in now, which yeah. is exactly what you're talking about. So, you know, there, there's instances on colleges, but I think the one that has sort of hit my world a lot is that I have found myself in the uncomfortable position of having to defend Richard Spencer's right to free speech. This is the alt-right, Pepe, green frog <laughs> leader, who, uh, wh whatever his politics are, I would suspect I disagree with this guy on probably 99% of the things. Uh, but you know, on inauguration day, he got punched. Uh, I'm sure you guys all saw it. Uh, and suddenly, a ton of liberals, unfortunately, were saying, yeah, it's okay to punch Nazis, as if we're in Indiana Jones. Um, or Baghdad. So, or, or Baghdad, there you go. Uh, 
So what about that, that once you've used these words and you've pinned everyone that's against you, well, everyone against me is a Nazi and I can punch Nazis, well, that's a pretty slippery slope, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, part of what's going on here isn't just the misuse of words, but I agree wholeheartedly it is. It's, it's a kind of, it's as, as I alluded to before, it's a rejection of the, the ability and in a sense the right or the value of thinking about what these words mean. And when you do that, I mean, when you hew to, uh, to sort of identity politics, let's say, or multiculturalism, the idea that, I mean, that's what multiculturalism is. That's why identity politics and multiculturalism are judging people on the basis of things like skin color, sexual orientation, class, et cetera. Although I think class is a made up issue, especially in this country. It's not in all times, in all countries, but here it is. But what you're ultimately doing is you're replacing um, judgment of ideas and replacing judgment of, of uh, the merits, the, the way we ought to judge people. So hearken back to Martin Luther King's famous statement, judge a man by uh, the content of his char character, not the color of his skin. Um, the people who punched Robert Spencer, uh, in my view, these are people who advocate the opposite of that. Whether they were willing to admit it or not, they want to judge people by the content of their skin. They just want to judge people as good because they're minorities as opposed to good because they're white people. That's fundamentally the same thing. And once you, once you trade judging people by the content of their character or by thinking, and you, and you, and you really you, you put aside the ability to really think and evaluate people, and now you're just looking at everybody as a member of some group or as a tribe, as I said before, the only uh, alternative is violence. And it makes sense that people would resort to violence and then start punching Nazis, because they don't know how to rebut their ideas. Um, and the only thing at that point is just attacking people. Yeah, and that's why, Faisal, for you, your life story is the antidote to this in a lot of respects. Because you grew up in a place where these ideas weren't okay. You were, o you were openly sort of an atheist in Iraq. That wasn't easy to do. Um, you were, you were drinking alcohol there. You told me that before. I don't yeah. know if I'm going to get you in trouble now. Well, alcohol uh, is tasty. That's a f <laughs> Especially um, margaritas. <laughs> um, but we can get some margaritas after cool. this. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so you grew up in that, and then you come here, and then you find yourself on the outside of what identity politics would do for sort of a, a Muslim brown person. I hate even talking in those terms. Yeah. But, but in a certain respect, the people that, that love all the SJW stuff and the identity politics and all that, in a weird way, you by, by speaking your own free mind, by talking about your own personal liberty and individuality, you, you flip that on its head and then, and then they have to hate you more. You, know, yeah. you have to be a traitor to them. That, that can't feel good. I mean, that, yeah, that's the, the concept of the narrative. I mean, the, so they have pushed, I mean, what I've observed since coming to America is that they have pushed a certain narrative of how someone like me should act. So if I don't fit to that narrative, I'm an Uncle Tom. So like, this is where, um, I mean, they, they try to push, I mean, it, uh, so now they have like a comprehensive attack strategy. So if you criticize Islam, let's say, you're white, like, shut up, you're privileged, you're white privileged, whatever, you cannot talk. If I do it, but doesn't fit the narrative, if I say whatever want, they wanted me to hear, I say that like, uh, America sucks, Jews suck, Israel suck, uh, Islamophobia, Islamophobia, it's all someone else's fault. If I say, if I fit into that narrative that we're just an oppressed minority and everything, they would love me. I would be, be Linda Sarsour. Yeah. Right? So. Sarsour, by the way, do you guys know what it means in Arabic? Anyone know? Cockroach. Cockroach. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, just say. Just yeah, say. so like they, they would, they, they, are, they were looking, I mean, within, at least within the, the left, is that, not all the left, obviously, I assume some of them are good people, again. Um, <laughs> is that they are looking for the narrative, is that if you push to that narrative, you, if I'm brown Muslim, let's say, and I say, yeah, colonialism is the reason why ISIS exists, uh, all of these things that the arguments that's being used by Muslim apologists, I fit in completely to that narrative, I'm promoted everywhere, right? But, and if I'm not, if I don't fit to that comprehensive strategy that they have put for us, then 
you are an outsider. I'm now white. I mean, I, I just thought that if you believe in the free speech, my skin get whiter. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean that's, I mean, I, I used to, in India, they have this product called Feta Lovely. Um, so, so it is like Feta Lovely. So you get your, your like a whiter skin, the more you advocate for American values. And that's not how it works. Um, so yeah, this is like kind of the biggest obstacle that I've been facing because on some side, on, on like some issues, I am, um, like for example, the refugee ban. When I was saying I was against the refugee ban, and I still am, um, I fit directly to that narrative, right? Iraqi refugee uh, who is advocating for refugee ban. Because I thought it's a bad idea. I can go for hours talking about how stupid that ban is. But anyway, um, so I completely fit that narrative. I was promoted, I was on CNN, I was on so many media outlets. And, like on, and they found me on Twitter. That's how I, they found me. But then I said like, Oh, I ended up on like death list by Muslim extremists. <laughs> Nobody covers that right. because it just doesn't fit into the narrative that they want to push. If I say any right wing stuff, any Trump stuff, I just fit into that narrative. He's a Iraqi refugee, therefore this. But if I say anything that is self-critical of my own culture, of my of the religion that my parents, at least I, I didn't grow up religious, but my parents grew up when grew up with. I would not fit to the narrative. Right, and, and, and oddly, it's, it's a lot of white liberals, not to you. I'm just using their game against them yeah, in this regard. It's white liberals that are doing no. it to you. There's always this guy who shows up on some of my speeches, hopefully not this, this one, but like he thinks that he knows more about the region than I do, which is fine. I mean, some people are more experts of the region than I do. But, and then he claims that my words or my criticism of Islam would further the right-wing narrative or further. And in fact, I see it as the opposite. If, if, we, if we speak the truth, we're going to take the power from all the bigots and all the, the real anti-Muslim bigots and the real apologists on the left. So like, in one way, I'm fighting the far right by telling the truth about how can we have a balanced position on Islam. Um, forgot your question. What was? That? Well, you got it. You got it. that was pretty good. You, you got yeah, something. Yeah. So there was always this. Yeah. There's always this white liberal who try to um, fucking white people. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, let's just say it. I mean, people. Cheers, 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 everyone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Trump in there, and I think he adds an interesting piece to this because we haven't talked that much. Well, he's about a person of color. He's orange. <laughs> 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 We're, I'm just setting you up here. This is good. Um, Trump, to me, on the free speech stuff, period, although I did not support him, I voted for Gary Johnson and I should be viewed as such. Um, <laughs> where's Aleppo again? <laughs> I should, he should have said, let me call Faisal. Yeah, someone in Michigan. Someone. <laughs> yeah, south side. Um, but Trump, I now believe, has been a net good for free speech because, as, because although everything feels crazy right now, I do feel that more people are in the game. I suspect some of you guys are kind of in this game now more because of his win, where I think had it gone the other way, the, the forces of some of these things that we're talking about, the screws would have been tightened against us. Now that's not, I'm not endorsing Trump. I know people will now say he's endorsing Trump. That's not an endorsement of Trump. We can talk more about Trump. But do you agree with that basic premise that everything is incredibly upside down right now and maybe because of that there's some, there's some movement here that could be good? So I'd like to ad address your endorsement of Trump, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I really yeah. think that's a problem. No, yeah. I mean there's definitely an upside downness to, to everything. Trump. Um, I think Trump is a phenomenon. Uh, I actually think it's a, it's a really negative phenomenon, and, and I'm not saying you support Trump at all. I'm just saying that that I, I think that I think he's he ultimately will turn into and what the phenomenon that Trump represents, not necessarily the man himself or the presidency himself or itself, but the phenomenon that it represents, I think, is a kind of a dark turn. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, and and there are, but there are ways in which you can understand the Trump phenomenon, certainly as, and I think this is true, as a reaction to, let's just call it the growing PC culture. Um, but, but I mean, to dig a little bit deeper, what I would say is this, if, if you hear from the time you're in grade school that people are defined by their race, sexual orientation, skin color, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
qualities that are immutable to them that they don't have any choice about. And then you have a hierarchy, right? And you, let's say you're a middle-class white person and you see that you're always on the bottom. A certain percentage of those people are gonna say, okay, I buy into the whole collectivist you know, tribalism, but to hell with that, I don't wanna be on the bottom, I wanna be on the top. So when my guy comes along and says, no, now you'll be on the top, a lot of people are gonna vote for him. Now that's a scary, in my view, that's a scary phenomenon. I get why it's happening, right? So we can, but we can explain it, we can understand why it's happening. And at the same time say, this is bad, because this leads to, I mean, like take a recent example, there were riots in Berkeley over the weekend. It was a pro-Trump rally versus the Antifa people. I mean, that's what the future of this kind of thing looks like. Now, I don't think you can sort of, I mean, in, there are ways in which you can blame Trump for that, and ways in which you can just say he was playing on uh, cultural and philosophical forces that have been uh, uh, sort of festering for a long, long time. Um, but I do think his election represents a kind of probably a turn for the worse. It doesn't mean that everybody who voted for him is a bad person. It does mean that we ought to take this as a wake up call. Like this is, this is a, a, a decisive step toward tribalism. And if you want to know what that looks like, look at what happened in Berkeley this weekend. I mean, you can look at it worldwide. It's a scary phenomenon. We do not want that to be the rule. We want it to never happen in this country. And if we want that to happen, we really need to start thinking about where did we go wrong? It wasn't just the election of 2016. These are ideas that have been in the culture, that have been taught to college kids, I would say since the 1960s, at least probably before that. We can talk about that if you want, but I mean, this is ultimately an ideological issue. It's a philosophical issue. It's a way that it's, it's an issue of how people view the world, what they accept as true, and then the logical result of bad ideas. Yeah, so that's I mean, good. Just to add to this, to the tribalism concept, I mean, the way that I think of the alt-rights is a white identity politics. Yes, yeah, I think that's it's, absolutely it's right. Just like, it's just like there is the, I mean, the other kind of identity politics, like the Muslim identity politics, the uh, black identity politics, etc. So now the alt-right is, I'm proud of being white male, Pepe the Frog, <laughs> screw, screw immigrants. This is like, it is to some extent, it is the white version of identity yeah. politics. Uh, coming from mostly guys who live in their basement, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, Sorry to be so factual, but like, uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so like, I mean, that's the tribalism. So now we're defined to be, not, yeah, not by the content of our character or our ideas, we're defined as alt-right is white identity politics versus the left is, le is minority identity politics, for lack of a better word, yeah. So I had your friend, and, and now my friend, uh, Jasmine Mohammed. Uh, yes. Yasmin no, Mohammed. Sorry, I gave her, I gave her the J. Culture appropriate her name. Yeah, Yasmin Mohammed on, on my show last week, and she very much falls in line with a lot of your thinking on this. And I asked her, well, what, what is the antidote? How do you actually fight this stuff? Uh, not only for people that are Muslim or ex-Muslim who are trying to extricate themselves from some of these ideas, but in terms of the chilling effect of free speech. And her answer was very simple, and it was, it was basically unapologetically defend liberalism. That real liberalism, not, not what's going on with, with the progressives these days and with the bulk of the left, and again, that's no defense of what's happening on the right, but that's the defense. So do you guys agree that getting those ideas out, like we've identified a problem. We all, we're all agreeing that there's a problem here. I think most of these guys probably are with us. Is, is that the best antidote to this? So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I do think so, but we got to be clear on what we need, mean by real liberalism. I think about it in the sort of classical liberalism. The way I would put it is, and I really love that. I, I'm going to have to watch that one. Tell her and tell her thank you for saying that because there are two components of that that are, are really important. It's unapologetically defend your right to free speech and unapologetically defend real liber liberalism. What I would uh, slightly uh, change the second part of that as Enlightenment values, and these are, and the best of enlightenment, and real enlightenment values. So, because there's a lot, uh, you know, people associate, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, slavery and racism. It's easy to paint the enlightenment and the founding of America with those things, because they were real phenomena, and they're horrifying phenomena. They're bad and they're wrong. You got to think about the ideas and what the ideas ultimately led to, which ult what they ultimately led to were. The, you know, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, the founding of America, and real freedom 
uh, the world over, uh, or large, in large parts of the world, which is ultimately what is it? What characterizes that point of view? It's a pro-reason point of view. It's a pro-reality point of view. It's it's I have the tools up here to understand what's out there, and there really is a something out there. And it's not a something out there that's created by all of us collectively in this room. We just imagine it, which is called social subjectivism, which is nonsense. Neither is it a reality created by you know, some magic spirit in the sky. It's really there. It's immutable. We have to figure out what it is. That's what the scientific method is for. And then there's an individual aspect to this. It's I have the necessity and the ability to do that. And I have to chart my own course in life. That's what the pursuit of happiness is all about. And then you get free speech and then interacting one with one, with one another. Let's see if we can cooperate. I mean, the, the flowering of modern civilization is an example of reason and individualism and cooperation in action. It gave us the greatest civilization in the history of the world. And I'm not just talking about America. I'm talking about post-enlightenment modern civilization. Uh, but the, and, then the, and then the unapologetic part is crucial, really, really crucial. I say this, and you've heard me say this many times, but I'll say it again. Do not apologize for thinking with your own mind. Do not apologize for speaking out. Sometimes you're going to be right. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. You have no uh, obligation to apologize if you're really engaged in honest effort to understand the real world. Do not take other people's sh efforts at shaming. We talked about that, all of the buzzwords. If somebody calls you a racist, challenge them. What the hell are you talking about? Why do you think I'm a racist? Um, the fact that I'm a white person or et cetera, whatever, it doesn't make me a racist. You know, really explain these terms, but do not apologize. You're an individual who has to chart your course in life. You have a right to live. You have a right to think. Absolutely never apologize for doing any of those things. That, that's actually a great segue to what I wanted to talk about next, which is sort of what you guys are going through right now at college. Can I add something? Like, I, 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 I was going to say something pretty brilliant there. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry, if, Dave. Yeah? yeah? Make it good. Uh, what do you got? Yeah, so I mean, I think that the, uh, add to this, I mean, I think that for people to stand for universal human rights, I think that as a, to, to be unapologetic about the importance of human rights over cultures and beliefs. So we have to be unapologetic for the fact that Humans have rights, cultures and beliefs don't have rights. And culture should be open to criticism and debates, and while human rights should be applied all across the board. So that is, I think, to add to what Yasmin was saying, is that, I mean, obviously liberalism is kind of a charge word. Everyone, may, it's like the Quran, everyone interprets it differently. But, well, not like the Quran, the Quran is yes, more Yes, liberalism's but, like the Quran. That's uh, the walk away <laughs> from this thing. I, mean. I have to self-correct myself, it's not like the Quran. It's more like the Hadith, not like the Quran. <laughs> No, no, that's progressivism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like we have to be unapologetic for standing for. So, like these issues that, like, that Canada is facing right now with like female gender mutilation, etc. We have to say that it's wrong. It doesn't matter whether you come from Senegal or Egypt or these women who are faced with female mutilation deserve human rights and it should be banned all across the board. So this is this kind of the approach that I think we should also be unapologetic about is stand for human rights regardless of the culture, not steep into this cultural relativism that some uh, other cultures may be as right. I mean, the culture that says gays have equal rights is superior to the culture that says gays should be killed. And we have to be unapologetic about that. We have to say, this is what we stand for, and our, our standard is, is what advances the human society, what reduces and increases, versus what increases human suffering. So we have to be honest about these values, because I think because of now kind of cultural relativism, now is like every, my truth, there's a concept of my truth. Oh, it's true for them. Like, no, there's no such thing as true for them. There is like some basic universal human rights that everyone should follow. Yeah, and you know, he, Faisal mentions, uh... He mentions gay rights. I, I just want to say, I, I'm not even gay. I married a guy just for the social justice points. <laughs> and I recommend you all try it yourselves. Um, now, now you can criticize Islam. I see, there you go. Um, so the way I want to relate this back to, to you guys sitting in this room is, you know, I, I make fun of trigger warnings and, and safe spaces all the time. Oh, by the way, there is a, we have a room on the other side of this wall. There's just a bunch of puppies in there and you can like roll around and whatever happens in those rooms, I'm not sure. Um, but that's why these things are so dangerous. Warning you that you might hear an idea that would challenge you 
in advance of hearing it. That, in a way, that's prejudice. That's prejudging. Uh, Wrong. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, but, I have some disagreement, but yeah, go ahead. But do, so when the well-intentioned people that come up with these ideas and say, well, we need, these are the words we can't say, and these are the ideas we can't talk about, and we got to warn you before we do this and all that, I believe a lot of these people are well-intentioned. I, I think there are some people, absolutely, that you alluded to earlier that are not well-intentioned, but I think for the most part, it's well, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, how do we get that not to have any power on campus? Because what's happening is these guys aren't hearing a plethora of ideas. Then you hear something that's a little out of what you're used to. Next thing you know, you're punching a Nazi. Yeah. 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 So like, to add like to trigger warnings. I mean, I'm I'm kind of agnostic about their effect, but like, I mean, just like there is in movies, you have a content warning in which you allow people who say, like there's going to be graphic images and stuff. Um, I think it probably, I mean, I'm not saying in absolute terms, but I think that it would be probable to say that, okay, we're going to talk about the Iraq war. There are going to be raped people over there. There are going to be people being beheaded. I think that, oh, you don't have to say it in these terms, but you say that there are going to be some violence in what I'm going to say, uh, even though I didn't trigger warm if I say this. But, but uh, I think that... I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should have trigger warnings all over, but I'm saying that it would be, I mean, I, I get triggered by something. I mean, I grew up in war, so there are some things that actually really trigger me. I mean, fireworks, sometimes if I don't know where they come from, I start being afraid because I grew up when there are bombs around and stuff in which I, uh, so I, I mean, not that I ask everyone who's doing a fireworks to give me 15 minutes introduction, <laughs> but at the same time, I think it would be maybe, maybe necessary. As I said, I'm agnostic. I'm not talking absolutes. But I think that if you're going to have, let's say, a lecture about, I don't know, uh, war and things like this, I think it would be probably necessary to say that to students that, OK, we're going to talk about war and there are going to be some graphic things. If but, you... but isn't that implied in college? I mean, I, I get the premise of what you're saying for sure, but isn't that the whole purpose of going to college? You're going to walk into a room. You might learn something that you didn't know before. That, no, that... it's not about learning it as a value. It's just like telling, I mean, obviously they have to learn something. That's what we go to college for. But, but the, just to tell them in advance that you're going to, because, yeah, some, some people who grew up in war and grew up in some bad conditions, like rape and others, will probably, if you just, like, take 10 seconds and say, like, we're going to talk about this and there are going to be some violent images, if they don't like, if you don't like the classroom, they can go back to their country, Right. That's a Trump thing, but like the, but yeah, I mean, if they don't like, if they don't like what is being said, they're not going to learn anything. But I think maybe it's necessary to just like, I mean, as I said, I'm agnostic. I'm not talking absolutes, but that's kind of my view. About yeah, this. I, I think um, I agree um, in the way that you put it, I think is, is, is exactly the right way to think about it. So trigger warnings, microaggressions, safe spaces, all these three of these buzzwords, they are, they all have elements of legitimacy to them. They've been vastly overused and taken way out of context. Um, I mean, the way I think about it is we didn't have those when I was in college. And I don't remember college being like mean and scary when I went to college. Maybe it was, but I don't really think it was. Now, but, but that doesn't mean they're totally illegitimate, illegitimate ideas. And your, your example is a good one. I mean, trigger warning, I'm pretty sure, uh, is it comes out of the whole idea of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a real thing. And, and like, you're a good example, right? So you grew up with bombs falling around you. And so there are certain things that are going to make you feel like, you know, tense and, and emotional, and you're not going to be able to learn. And so it would make sense in, in certain contexts for a professor to, to issue a trigger warning. I, th I mean, my own view is those can be very sensible uh, aspects of etiquette, politeness. They should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. They should be up to the professors. I don't think, I mean, I, I tend to think they've been vastly overused and vastly overapplied. You can see that by the kinds of lists of trigger warnings and other microaggressions that po colleges um, uh, publish, and then they become politicized. Uh, I'm reminded of the one in uh, uh, UCLA, or it's, it's the UC system that uh, published, I think, a list of microaggressions, and one of them was, uh, America is the land of opportunity. You're never allowed to say that. That's a microaggression. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, maybe it's debatable in some ways, but that's just crazy, you know? But Faisal, true or false? America, <laughs> land of opportunity? I think so. 
But maybe. I mean, there, well, there are, uh, there are. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on how much I get paid per month, but yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there are ways to use these terms. They don't have to become entire movements. And there's an element of infantilization of college kids these days that, you know, when there's a movement that demands a trigger warning every time anybody's going to talk about, you know, uh, anything having to do with sex or rape or et cetera, there was a, there's a famous example of. Uh, a criminal uh, a crim law crim, uh, criminal law class at Harvard, and uh, a, a woman was demanding, or some group was demanding, trigger warnings every time they talked about the issue of rape. And of course, it's criminal law. I mean, rape is part of what you need to learn. If you're objecting to that, like, how are you going to go out and become a prosecutor, defense attorney, or a judge? Like, that ain't going to work. You're in a, a situation in which it's logical that rape is going to come up. If you want to not go to class or you want to talk to the professor, by all means do that. The idea that the entire class has to sort of accede to your uh, unique concern with this is crazy. I mean, so there are ways of dealing with this in an individual, logical, reasonable, sensible way, but that's not what we're seeing today. Yeah, I think this is what you guys have probably heard Ben Shapiro refer to as feelings over facts. That we feel offended by things and we think that that then has value and that dovetails nicely with, uh, I, I credited you last night with coming up with the Oppression Olympics, but that wasn't you? No, that, that my response is as an immigrant, I stole it from other people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is true. I mean, I, I did steal it from someone. I don't know who is this person, but I, I stole it. Yeah. It wasn't, I don't take credit for it, so. But it's a, it's a great phrase because it shows that there's just sort of this pyramid that depending on how you fit in those immutable characteristics, that that's how you're valued. And ironically, at the top of that pyramid at the moment, by their own doing, is Islam, which would gladly subjugate any of those people. So as someone that was born Muslim, you must be looking at this and going, this is some bullshit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it all depends on how you look at the pyramid. I mean, now the most oppressor is white, male, and then after that is ISIS, then the female, white, white female. So like ISIS is right on the top, but like the, yeah, so. When, when you talk about straight white men, could you address Steve directly? I think that would <laughs> probably. <laughs> Yeah, so the, I mean, so that is, yeah, I mean, which is kind of really interesting because Islam is not a minority religion. I mean, that's, that's something I recently learned in America in which Islam is actually a minority religion. It's not, it's the second, I mean, if you don't include atheism, it's the second biggest religion in the world. So this concept that Islam should deserve this extreme special protection from any form of criticism um, is absurd, and even if, Islam was a minority religion. Like, let's assume, so what? I mean, you judge the thing by its value, not by whether it's a minority religion or it's not a minority religion. I mean, maybe somebody can identify ISIS as a minority religion. Oh, we should be inclusive of ISIS and bring them to the panel. So in that way, we have to be more inclusive. And we, th there has to be, obviously, a red line. Not the Obama red line, but like a real red line. <laughs> um, oh. In which you... <laughs> and which you say that some, I, like, I mean, the, the, the value, I mean, you can, somebody can talk about Islam. That's, the, as I said, back to the Islamophobia thing, is that people are conflating criticism of Islam of hatred of Muslims. And now to criticize Islam is, to, is equivalent to criticizing minorities. And that creates huge confusion. I mean, Islam, just like any other religion, is filled with bad ideas. And some of these ideas need reform or maybe should, people should stop believing in them. Yeah. And uh, this, I mean, it's really interesting how many people who, liberals who place enlightenment that happened in Christianity, but are stopping the enlightenment that's trying to happen in Islam. So they are, uh, they say, oh, well, we have it better. We got uh, Christianity, it got reformed, or maybe many people become atheists. But no, you as Muslims, you cannot do this. We're gonna take care of you. We are the white saviors from the liberal planets who are going to uh, try to uh, stop the enlightenment that we had. So in, in some sense, I mean, many of, of those who believe in oppression Olympics are stopping the Islamic reform and, and, and the enlightenment that is happening in Islam that leads Islam to, protect, to be more respectful of human rights and be more inclusive. And that's like, it's really, that's why... And, my, and that's the soft bigotry of low expectations, right? Yes. Uh, and I, I, I talked about that in your show when I was talking about like the, the left Islamist alliance. So in a weird way, 
the lefts, not the, I mean, again, I assume some of them are good people. I don't want to generalize. Uh, but some people within the left, at least with the Democratic Party and also within the administration, with the former administration, they did not hire the liberal Muslims who actually adhere to the same values that, say, Obama adheres to, as they say, in terms of social liberalism. He hired conservative Muslims to be on his side. Well, so, like, you see a very weird alliance between conservative Muslims, or let's say the far-right Muslims in terms of, of religious belief, and the left-wing liberals. And what the fuck, right? <laughs> Is that... <laughs> On... And well, then, you know what? I think we should make this a little bit of a Maury Povich moment, because we've got Faisal's uncle, who's a member of ISIS. <laughs> hi, hi, how are you guys? Uh, have a seat, have a seat. You're supposed no. to be here, I don't no. know. Uh, um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah, so that is, that's kind of the absurd. So you see, like, up, up is down, down is up, right? Those who are socially liberal Americans side with socially conservative Muslims in the name of inclusive and multiculturalism. Like, the Women's March, for example, they allowed a woman who... So in, in one way, they are, like, against modesty culture. So, I mean, I support. I mean, I'm, I consider myself a feminist, at least on weekends. Um, <laughs> the, um, so I support, like, most of the values that... The women's rights movement, like pro-choice, all of these things. They brought someone who has, who has the hijab, which is a symbol of modesty culture. So in one, in one weird way, the social liberal people who, like, all against modesty culture and against social conservatism coming from Christianity, are in one way allowing socially conservative symbols because it's coming from a minority religion. I mean, this is... Right, they would never do this with, you know, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish woman exactly. wearing a, a thing on her head or, or a Mormon underwear or... Well, Mormon... <laughs> that's yeah. just funny, but... but. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's the thing. I mean, they, they would... I mean, as far as I heard, like, they banned, for example, pro-life Christian organizations, but they brought Muslims who are pro-life because when, the moment you're a minority, the standards are different. It's no longer a standard all across the board. It's all about... Again, back to identity politics, is that, okay, so she's a woman Muslim, that's like plus five, minus six. Okay, then like, she, her, her legs don't work properly, so that's like minus 15. And then like, she's up as a speaker. This is the way so, so, uh, that they judge speakers. So like, and, and I have another leak, is that says that women, they, so when they were trying to do speakers, they only allowed women who wear hijab to be speakers or organizers, because to prove true diversity. So they are the ones who are now deciding what is, what is a true Muslim and what is not. They, they are the ones who say like, okay, the hijabi Muslim woman is the only authentic version of Islam because we want to show, so imagine like I want to show true Americans and I brought Sarah Palin on the panel and say like, oh, this is, I want to bring true Americans to this. I'm going to decide what is the authentic thing and that's what's happening right now. I mean, and, it's really yeah. absurd. Yeah, at the same time, I'm sure many of you saw this just two weeks ago, Ayan Hirsi Ali's tour in Australia was canceled because of threats of violence. And it was, that was lauded by a couple of the, the Muslim feminist organizations. So, so therein lies rub. So what I want to bring up to you, Steve, is one of the things that Faisal and I have been talking about privately is obviously we're, we're both frustrated with the left. And I've tried to make it my life's work to do a little something here with them. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but for people, for young people that are, that are socially uh, liberal, that don't mind gay marriage, that you know, want to legalize marijuana, that don't care what you do in the privacy of your own home and all that, just putting economics aside, how, how can the right reach out to those people in a, in a sensible way? I think the right would have to change radically. I think it would have to give up on, and so let me, I'll preface this by saying, I don't think of this issue, and I don't think of most issues in left-right terms, because I don't think that those categories are really meaningful categories. I don't think they really define fundamental differences in ways of looking at the world, and, and, uh, and so I think it's a mistake to think of it as, to, to sober, oversimplify it, on free speech, left, bad, right, good. Because it's, it's not true historically at all. And it leaves, and it's just weird. I mean, when you think of, I gave this example the last time we did this, as, you know, Sam Harris considered himself on the left. You'd have to put him on the bad category. Ayan Hirsi Ali is much more on the right. You'd, you'd have to put her in the, in the good, they're really, you could take them both apart and they would be much more similar than they are different. And yet you'd be putting them in these odd categories. Um, so I think the, the, I don't look at the, 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 the right as necessarily good on this. 
And historically, that's definitely true. The right has been against free speech for a long time. I would say, I actually think you're going to see a resurgence of attacks on free speech among uh, on the right, especially with Trump in office and with Jeff Sessions as attorney general. Um, but uh, so I think you really have to think about it from the standpoint of looking at individuals uh, trying to get a sense of what do they believe fundamentally? Do they fundamentally believe in reason? Do they fundamentally believe in free speech? Are they willing to accept fact-based fact arguments? Do they have a positive view of uh, a free society? And I would say Western society or the Enlightenment. It doesn't necessarily mean only people from the West. Western society or Western civilization is a body of ideas. But you have to look at those kinds of things. Uh, to really understand um, what you know, uh, where people are coming from, as to what the right would have to do, I mean, I think the the biggest problem on the right on all issues is that it's fundamentally motivated by religion, and it has many of the same problems um, that uh, that not only Islam say uh, has and the, and the issues you've been talking about, but I think there's a kind of parity on right and left. That, that you can look at right as mo motivated by uh, religion, a real religious version of religion, a sectarian view, and the left motivated by a kind of secular version of religion, which multiculturalism, I mean, you could look at socialism, communism, they all have the trappings of religion. They're ideologies that determine your entire way of life. They're divorced from, uh, from reality. They, they have authority figures that pass down knowledge to people. You're not allowed to question those ideas. Uh, there's much more we could say about that. Um, so, I mean, if I were to, to I mean, I'll probably put it in old guy terms here, but I always look at uh, that, that, that uh, uh, talking about this in terms of left versus right is kind of like uh, criticizing the, you know, the, the Rotarians because they're not enough like the Moose Lodge or like the, uh, you know, yes, any of those. Yes, those are wonderful Yeah, examples. well, you know, I like to try to relate to young people, and, and I think <laughs> I, I'm learning from you. Yeah, that, you know, I know. I you completely know, understand what you that, just said. That, see, I knew he, he, he <laughs> No, I didn't. I'm just he was watching yeah, yeah. American yeah. television, you know, yeah. that's circa 1950. That's all he was getting, probably, yeah, so he gets all this the stuff. The Rotarians, but, that's a new uh, one. Um, yeah, but, but I, I don't think, I mean, I think it's very difficult for the right to reach out. That doesn't mean there aren't good voices on the right. There are very good voices on the right. And in the last decade, two decades, the left, I think, has been worse on free speech. And again, it's difficult to even define these terms. Um, what, I think the way you put it as regressive left, that's a much better way to put it because that's a real kind of, I mean, it's associated with 19th century progressives. There's very much collectivism, anti-individualism anti-Enlightenment and anti-Western uh, uh, strain running through this. And I think just to make one final point, to pick up on something Faisal said, so the whole oppression Olympics uh, uh, issue and the fact that it is so bizarre to see Western, quote, liberals siding with people who want to murder gay people, who want to subjugate and basically enslave women. I mean, let's just be, be factual about this. It's basically a form of slavery. You know, maybe it's a little bit of slavery and not a lot of slavery, but it is effectively the same thing. Uh, preventing them from driving cars, owning property, all of the things that women have fought to get you know, the rights to in Western civilization for the last 200 years, and for some reason it's all okay. I think what you're seeing there is, I would put it as Islam and the Islamic world represents about as close to the anti-West as you can get, right? And so if you have a philosophy that holds that everything that, that Western culture represents is somehow evil, you are naturally going to turn to the exact opposite of that. And you're going to look at that, yeah. and you're going to say, that must be the good because I've rejected this as the evil. Now, they're not thinking. These are categories that they're thinking. They're not really using real thought, but that, I think, is a real strong strain of what's going on. And once you do that, you're willing to just ignore uh, all of the horrific things that, uh, that, uh, um, that, in, that have been done in the name of Islam. And by the way, I'm not, I'm ecumenical here. I would say the same thing about Christianity. I would say the same thing about Judaism. You can find times in history when all religions have been horrifying and you get the same kind of reaction to it. It's this glossing over, it's remaking, you know, rewriting history in a way that makes these ideologies and we saw the same thing with communism, right? There were apologists with communists saying, oh, Stalin's the wave of the future. He's, you know, and I mean, right up to the fall of the Berlin Wall, you still had, you know, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the only place 
that communism and Marxism was still popular was, guess where? On America's campuses or on world campuses, which is why I think a lot of these ideas have, have survived. Yeah, well, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned why that the left-right thing doesn't matter that much. Because I, I find, I get caught in this sometimes, that I have to use these terms to kind of explain what we're talking about so people understand the, the basic ideas. Uh, I have no illusions that I can, or any of us can magically make religious people not religious. And, and if you, what you do in the privacy of your own home, I have no problem with. Um, but I do believe that we can create a new center here. So let, let's just do a quick poll. How many of you are passionately either Republican or Democrat by, by a show of hands? Well, I got a thumbs down over there, okay. All right, so we got one guy kind of waving at me like this. I mean, so basically about, yeah, I got somebody's giving me the finger, I'm not sure. That's to me or to the parties, okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, so I mean, look at that. that. That says it right there. I mean, this is a, a room of smart college people. <laughs> Wait, was you making a joke on yourself there, or did I overrate the university? What did I do there? Uh, yeah, this is a room of smart people, you know what I mean, and young people, and they don't care about their traditional labels, and that's where I think we can start building some new alliances. Are you with me on that? Yeah, I mean, I've always, like, since I came to America, I consider myself politically homeless. Um, so, I, I mean, I share ideas that are across the board. I mean, uh, I, first and foremost, I'm for human rights and freedom and secularism. These are like my main uh, values. And, and uh, to, see, to see these values being attacked by pretty much the extremes of both sides, um, I think there is definitely a room for improvement. I, I, I mean, there are multiple ways of doing this improvement. Is that, let's say, a new center, or we're trying to bring reason to politics, which is kind of difficult. But the, I mean, we can either be like an equivalent of a Tea Party influence, which is many of them vote Republican, but at the same time, they try to influence the Republican Party to be more crazy than it actually is, right? And then you have the regressive left movement that tries to influence the Democratic Party and make it more crazy than it actually is, right? So we can probably be like this in which we try to, and I think that our ideas, considering that they belong to multiple uh, uh, visions, we can actually probably have influence on both parties. I mean, I, I think it's very unlikely, and that's not a pessimistic view, I think it's a more realistic one, is that, that America can have a third party. I think it's almost impossible. So what we can do is that we can be enough of a movement that can influence both parties to be more reasonable. And that's what I'm actually trying to do with, it. I mean, with the Islam subject is that I do interviews with right-wing people and try to move them more to be a balanced position on Islam and try to interview with left-wing people to bring them more position on Islam. I think that, I mean, this is my way uh, and, I, and I'm open to listen to different ideas, but I think that this is the concept of a new center that you, you and I and Sam Harris and others have been popularizing is that this is, I think, our main influence can be, is that we talk to both sides of the aisle and make them more reasonable, and hopefully some of them will share our ideas and become empowered. I mean, that, inshallah, as they say in Arabic, um, if God is willing. Yeah, so that maybe hopefully that, that will be our influence. Can I just make one quick sure. comment on that? I mean, I agree with, I think there's a whole lot to what you're saying. I wouldn't think of it in political terms. I tend to think this has to be sort of bottom up rather than top down. If you think of politics as, as the top and ideas at the bottom, or another way to put it, uh, is, is that politics is downstream from culture and philosophy, so cu culture and philosophy is where it's at. But I like the idea of, <clears throat> if you don't think of it in terms of political terms, it's a movement of people who are pro-reason, pro-individualism. Um, I, think, I think they have to be willing to sort of check their religion at the door. They have to be pro-free speech. Um, they have to be, in a sense, pro-enlightenment. That kind of an, a movement influencing everybody and grabbing all of the people who are confused, don't know what to think, and thinking of it more in terms of um, you know, the, the, the values that, that made Western civilization what it is, or made America great. Uh, that, I think, is, is the, that's where I would focus on. And that's what I hope. And I got to say, you guys are examples of this. And I would applaud both of you, especially him, but, but also <laughs> you. But I mean, seriously, yeah. think of what Dave has done. Dave has struck out and he's, he's decided to say, you know, to hell with the mainstream media and the, and the, the way everybody, I'm going to speak directly to people. He's been wildly successful. It's a huge risk to do that. Think of what Faisal has done. That's it. I mean, you want to talk about 
oppression. You want to talk about real risk? Think about this guy's life. Like all, I think of when I think of all of the people. Oh, I'm an oppressed person going to Yale, and I'm oppressed because somebody <laughs> so because somebody said something that I didn't like about Halloween costumes. And then you compare it to Faisal oppression and saying the wrong thing means death or incarceration. There's no comparison there, none whatsoever. So what we need is guys like you know these people standing up and saying, you know, th we're going to lead this movement. We are really going to push forward and, and you know, tell our stories and make clear that there's a whole different way of looking at the world than what you're getting on college campuses these days. Well, I mean, there you have it. Faisal escaped Saddam Hussein and theocracy. I started a YouTube channel. Yeah. So anyone, anyone, anyone can live the, the dream. Anyone can do anything. All right, so we're going to do just a couple more minutes here, and then we'll, we'll do a Q&A for an hour or however long you guys want to go. If you want to just yell at us and say mean words, <laughs> yeah. whatever you want to do, we do believe in free speech, so we'll let you do that. Uh, but just, my, just don't call me fat, please. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a special diet now, right? Uh, you're, yeah. you're, he's not eating meat. We're in Austin, Texas. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> or you don't eat meat at midnight. It's like a gremlin yeah, thing. What so are you doing? I mean, I don't want to, I mean, let me popularize this because I think it's a great idea is that, so it's called reducitarian. I don't know if you have heard of it. So it's, because vegetarianism is extremist, right? It's like ISIS. But the, <laughs> um, but the concept that of- That got the biggest applause of the night. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the concept of reducing meat consumption seems like a good idea. I mean, I always, I've, I've always been advocate for a humane treatment of animals, uh, which is absurd coming from me. But the, uh, I've always been an advocate for a human, but I still like the kebabs. So that's, so, so I had to make a balance. Okay, I'm gonna have a kebab for lunch and I'm gonna have a salad for dinner. So this is, so this is kind of what, what reducitarianism means, is that you reduce the consumption of meal. I mean, it seems like I'm still fat, but, but I still, I'm better than I was one month ago. So, yeah. so that's, that's, that's a start. Yeah, I didn't even think you were gonna explain that whole thing, so all right. Um, <laughs> All right, so you know what, why don't we do just a, a closing statement each and then we'll open it up, uh, open it up to them. So uh, Steve, I'll let you go first. I mean, I'll just uh, reiterate something I said before. Speak, speak confidently, don't be apologetic about it. Um, find other people who are like-minded. Um, uh, try to create groups on campus that are, um, that are like-minded about issues like free speech. Think hard about what it means to value free speech and why it's a value, not just a right understand what the right actually means, um, meaning the right to free speech. It doesn't mean that you're entitled to a microphone. It doesn't mean you get to speak on, on other people's property. It does mean the government can't prevent you from speaking. But understand the value of reason and, uh, and free speech. If you do come up against people who are trying to, to tear you down, trying to stop you from speaking, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's outside of the classroom, try to be as reasonable as you can make good arguments, you would be surprised at how far a good, rational argument goes. Always remember that everybody, especially if you're speaking to a crowd, there are lots of people paying attention who are learning and listening to you, even if they aren't speaking up. It's those people you want to, uh, you want to reach out to. The guy that's screaming in your face, he's a prop. Consider him a prop. To, to be able to address the people who aren't screaming at you, but might just take something from your talk and say, you know what, that was an interesting point. I'm gonna pursue that and, and don't be afraid. Just you know, don't give up on this because it's vitally, vitally important to, to civilization. And, and real, yeah. <laughs> really quick, just as an addition to that, that's why the, the, our intellectual opponents are so quick to silence people and so quick to protest people and so quick to use all those buzzwords to, to shut all you guys up because their arguments aren't that good. So get them to the place of the argument. Is Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think that to, to, to bring the final solution to this, <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> uh, I mean, the most important thing is I think that we need to, the movement that agrees with the ideas that we're talking about, we really need to organize. I think that, what I've noticed, like coming, I mean, I haven't lived in America long, but I lived for four years so far, is that I've seen how much this, the regressives and others are very organized and they are able, I think it's not only about the numbers, it's that sometimes a very small group, if they're organized, they can achieve much more than a, a group all across the board that doesn't do anything. So I think that for all, for all of you who are interested, uh, 
I mean, I'm starting a new organization that tries to organize the ideas that we're talking about and uh, collectively, sorry to use the word collective here, but, <laughs> but uh, collectively, I think we can do something because I think there is a large growing movement um, of the people who adhere to our ideas. I mean, just like you, I mean, most cases I get at least 100 or 200 each event I do. And they all, some sense, I mean, they don't have to agree with me, but they agree that the rights of free speech are important, the rights of human rights are important, the rights for defending uh, universal human rights, all of these things. Um, so my, I mean, I don't really have a, uh, I didn't prepare anything, but like, I think what we all need to do is we, we try to organize and hopefully we can bring these values to the public and also to the government. I mean, I think the only thing that I can add to that is that we simply need you. It really is that simple. We need you. I, I'm one guy that decided to, to create a YouTube channel, and some people dig it, and it's working, and that's great. Uh, but you guys can all do that, too. And the more of us that just will not be held hostage to these ideas, that will not... I, I get people that message me that'll say, you know, Dave, I was going to post your clip you know, with Faisal, and I, I didn't want my, my aunt to think I'm racist. And it's like, man, if that's... But, you know, it, it sounds funny, but... We're really, we're holding ourselves hostage, which is, I think, how we started this whole thing. We have to stop doing that. But the only way we do it is by you guys getting involved. So look at it this way. If you don't, where do you think we'll be in five years? You know, like, there's, there's only a limited amount of people that are doing it. So we, we genuinely need you guys. And with that, uh, with that in mind, uh, thank you guys for coming out and, and supporting free speech. And uh, we'll gladly take some questions. There are, there are microphones on each side. And uh, don't be shy. Say all kinds of mean things to us. Let's go. What do you, oh, uh-oh, he's got a computer with him, too. Hey, so, is this live? Uh, is that, can we just confirm the mic's on? Hello? All right, why don't we jump over here to start, and then we'll go. Hey, thank you guys for coming. Um, Dave, I... Or, you I, know what, just speak up, and we'll, we'll figure out the mic situation. Why don't you speak into the mic, just in case it's being recorded, and even just speak loudly. Yeah, okay. Again, thank you guys for coming. Um, really appreciate that. Um, Dave, I think you've talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, we're seeing now, in like the last few months, you know, social media sites like YouTube uh, demonetizing people, um, Twitter shadow banning people, uh, and if not outright banning people. Um, and as a content creator myself, you know, who's trying to, who's slowly building, you know, my platform, I'm, I'm kind of worried about, you know, if I'll even have a voice, you know, since the left seems so willing to de-platform pretty much everybody, no matter what their political per persuasions are, you know, um, once they veer off the... Um, the, uh, the the place of acceptable opinion. So I was wondering, like, you know, what you know, what's your interpretation of that, and if you have any solutions to that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have been asking me this question. So for those of you that aren't that familiar with this with this whole thing, about a month ago, uh, a whole bunch of advertisers pulled out of YouTube, and in effect, they're now demonetizing videos. So my video uh, with Yasmin Mohammed, where we only talked about liberalism. I mean, we did we did this. In my studio a few days ago, they demonetized that. Our, our rev, I think, this month is down like 60% while our watch time and our views are up. So I'm not doing this to cry me a river as much as this is the reality. We all opt into these things for free, right? You're all on YouTube and you're on Twitter and Facebook and these are all free things. So we're sort of, we're, we're beholden to them, which kind of sucks. I suspect that it's become so obvious what's happening right now. Uh, and the shadow banning and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm sure that stuff's going on. And how many times have literally, quite literally, have I helped you get your page yeah. unbanned on Facebook? So I mean, his page. Yeah. Big and I, and I have a here. joke about yeah. that, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so we look, but we opt into these things and these companies ultimately can do what they want. If, if YouTube wants to you know, bag all the money tomorrow, then, then they can. Uh, so I, I suspect that somebody's smart and I know that there are some conversations I'm involved in, some of them are trying to figure out what the answers are to this. Um, but I would say more than anything else, just keep making your stuff. 
just keep making your stuff. And, and if you're doing, if you, first off, if you're on YouTube for money, you should probably have your head examined. But uh, you know what I mean? Like, keep doing your stuff. And, and the, the other piece eventually will come. Uh, you know, and all of this was just part one of the internet, where everyone got everything for free. And maybe the next part is you actually maybe have to put a dollar or two in to opt in. And uh, I wish I had a better answer that, that we could all walk away with, but it, we're, it, it's in flux right now. Just, just let me share one of the reasons I got banned on Facebook. I made this joke. I said, if you don't like ISIS, join them because change comes from within. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, and I literally got banned for 30 days yeah. from Facebook yeah. just because of this joke. For, like They said that I advocated violence. I'm like, this is a joke. It's a fucking joke. Yeah. Uh, so this is like, well, like I, I've been banned from Facebook like at least 20 times so far. And it's, it is just like, I mean, once I was, my, I was, my friend was criticizing the Taliban. I literally. think we're streaming this on Facebook, by the way. So you oh, could have yeah. just got banned again. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. I'm going to censor myself then. Okay. Uh, but yeah, my Al Rizvi, who was on the show, was criticizing the Taliban. And I shared his post. So he got banned and I get banned. I was like, <laughs> so like even so, so like criticism of Taliban, some people reported it and stuff, uh, and we eventually got banned from Facebook. I mean, I, I really, I mean, I've had some talks with some people who worked at Facebook, and it's still like up in the air. Like they don't, I don't think they still have figured it out, like what they should do about these kinds of stuff. And it's, it's really harmful because for some of like, for me, like these tools like YouTube and Facebook, if, from where I come from in the Middle East, because most of the media is state-sponsored, right? So, so the, the, the government controls lots of the media, and they control most of the things that get shared. And these companies like Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube are like the biggest vehicle in the fight against extremism in terms of ideas and stuff. And now these same companies are censoring those who are fighting extremism, which is, so, I mean, which is all what they got. Like the, Twitter, I mean, Twitter, if you look at the human rights activists on, on Twitter, Many of them like from Saudi Arabia and Qatar, all these areas, and they get censored by Twitter because of this political correctness. So, that, so in one way, these companies are harming our best weapons against extremism because of their uh, censorship of free speech. And on one side, so I mean, I'm not a fan of Milo. I mean, I think that we need more multi freedmen than we need Milos. But at the same time, I like Ayatollah Khamenei who is the, the Ayatollahs of Iran, say much more crazy things on Twitter than Milo. And that's not a defense of Milo. I mean, the standard is low, right? If that's so, a defense of Milo. Yeah. So as I, as I said, the standard is low. So by comparison, Milo looks like an angel. But at the same time, there's all these Muslim extremists. And like, for example, Uraifi was one of the biggest imams in Saudi Arabia who literally supported Jabhat al-Nusra, which is like Al-Qaeda group in Syria. And yet he does not get censored, and yet somebody say something, whatever, racist and xenophobic, they, they are worse than what this person is advocating for. Like, this is what I think that, we, like, these companies really need to figure out, like, which, I mean, if they're going to censor, at least censor those who advocate for direct incitement of violence, not those who say stupid jokes on Twitter. I mean, that's, that's all I can say. By the way, I don't think they're going to do any of those things, unfortunately, any of the things to, to reform themselves. But I do think someone will step into the market and, and fix it for them. OK. Yeah, I had to use, oh, wait, there we go. Um, Caleb, thank you so much for your guys' time. This has been real enjoyable. Pardon the bird, it was friendly. Uh, so my, my tiny project stories of refuge off the Syrian border last year got picked up off by the Human Rights Foundation two weeks ago, and I've been invited to the Oslo Freedom Forum. Oh, nice. And so, oh. <laughs> so this is a bit of a specific question, but I'm going to have a chance to travel across Europe and back to Lebanon off the Syrian border, and we're going to be visiting Orthodox, Muslim, Christian, humanists, and even like a self-proclaimed anarchist camp of providing relief to... Um, the mass migration, or however you want to word that. I don't think God can be removed from the dialogue, given the nature of the East and the West and the condition. As one seeking to storytell, to mobilize solution to incredibly vulnerable Syrians in Lebanon in one of the most distressed positions, what do you think in this concept of free speech and storytelling to tell a, a provocative story of how God is a part of this? Tell them about this guy. That's it right there. Tell them about this guy, because that's the story that they need to hear, that they can have what you have. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question, but like, are you saying that like, how can we utilize a free speech to change these minds of these people? Well, and tell the story of multiple religions in the name of their God doing this work to assist Syrians. Like, what do you think is a narrative as media professionals that do you, that would gravitate with like this the story of what people want to see? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this, I think that when I, I mean, I've been recently been interviewed by a guy who's like doing a thesis at Harvard about like what would be the most effective ways to influence people within these regions, and I think that. Acknowledgement of their suffering is a start. When you don't acknowledge their suffering, they're generally not gonna listen to you. So you have to have a kind of a basic understanding what these people are suffering from. And you tell them the story that the suffering needs to end. So if you share a story of suffering from what the Christian minorities are facing or the Yazidis in Iraq are facing and so on, to the way that they see that their suffering are being acknowledged and then acknowledged, and then you tell them what you want, whatever, ideas you want to push at them afterwards. But I think that one of the most, most effective ways of dealing with people, with region are dealing with, is that acknowledgement of their suffering. And then, so you, you can make it and say like, okay, this is, and like people are suffering a lot, this is what Yazid is being raped, et cetera, et cetera, and we need to end this at the end of, of this. And I think that's gonna be much more influential than just talking about, not that I'm against ideas or stuff, but like I think that is going to be much more influential than talking about oh why we need why John Stewart Mill book on liberty makes good uh, good arguments for free speech. I think that if you just go within their suffering, uh, not that I want to go to a Prussian Olympics, but I think that people there want acknowledgement of their suffering, then you can talk to, to them about your story. Um, so I guess in short, the question is. Um, how do we account for the rise of identity politics in the last few years? And because I know that's a really big question and I have a specific concern, I just want to narrow it down a little bit by saying that it's, it seems like um, there have been so many movements since liberalism kind of came on the scene that on both the right and the left, as Steve pointed out, that kind of have the same fundamentally anti-liberal, anti-individualist, um, spiritual maybe um, character to them. And it makes me wonder if there's something about the character of liberal society, radical freedom, radical individualism, that is somehow a misunderstanding of the human condition such that it's not meeting some basic need that leads to the emergence over and over again of these kind of radical groups on either side. And I wanted to know if you guys thought that that was a real thing and if that accounted for the phenomenon of identity politics. And if it does, how do we as uh, classical liberals kind of create a society that addresses the needs of those people without conceding to them. Steve, I'm going to let you handle that one, but it's a really great question that how can our tolerance, which is built into the ideology of liberalism, how can that actually be used against us in a time of intolerance, which we see a lot of these days? It's a great question. Yeah, it is a good question. The second part is really hard to answer, and, I, and so all I'll say is, I mean, I don't think there is something in the nature of humanity that needs a kind of identity politics, or the way I would put it is tribalism, but there is something to the idea that there are an awful lot of people out there who would prefer a position of dependency rather than independence, and a free society ultimately is a society of individuals who are independent and independent thinkers. It doesn't mean everybody has to be. But it's a really broad question, so I, that's about the best I can tell you. But but. To your first question, or your, the first part of your question, why do we think that there's a rise, or why, why does it seem like there's a rise in identity politics re relatively recently? I would say this is a phenomenon that's been going on at least since the 1960s, and frankly, you can trace it back further than that. But let's start with the 1960s, because that was the first generation uh, of, like, that was a generation that was really weaned on collectivist Marxist ideas, and most of the ideas that we're talking about here are fundamentally collectivist, or, or most of them are Marxist, and all of them are fundamentally collectivist. And they gained a lot from Marxism. It's totally different than what Marxism was, or it's, it's different in, in, in its superficials, but it's, it's, it's the same in the sense that Marx preached that we are societies made up of warring classes of oppressors and oppressed, and essentially neither, none of these various classes can communicate with, with one another, and that's essentially what you're seeing with multiculturalism and identity politics. Why it's rising now, it's a, my hypothesis is 
The millennial generation is the first generation that's gotten that from like the minute they were born up until college. And they've, they've, been, they've been getting the same ideas from the time they were in kindergarten. And I think they're the first generation who's gotten that totally uh, in every element and every step of their education. And so that we're really seeing it come out in much more uh, virulent form or much more consistent form with, with the millennials. But I don't know if I'm right about that. It's a hard question to answer. All I'll say is these ideas have been with us for a long time. And, and ultimately, if we don't know how to defend a liberal, free, individualistic, enlightenment society, um, we are going to be we're going to succumb to bad ideas. So we need better defenses than we've had. And I would even say the founders made some mistakes. So. Um, what we need is a better defense of reason. We need a better defense of individual rights. Um, a lot of other things. I'll put in a plug here for my organization and for Ayn Rand. I think she provided that. Um, but I mean, that's up to you guys. You should read that. You should read her ideas and, and think them through. Um, but that's ultimately what we need. But it's a really good question. Hey, thanks for the speech. And so my question is about the American Capitalist Party. Um, I know <laughs> you've had Mark Pellegrino on yep. and talked to him about that, uh, but it seems like it's really not anything at this point. What do you think would be the best way to introduce a new political party? We've seen a bunch of third parties try to do this. Um, I know you've mentioned like trying to get the right to come left a bit or the left to go right a bit, um, but when there's really no political party that defends individualism like 100%, I can't get behind any political party without feeling like I'm compromising my values. Mm -hmm. uh, but after reading through the policies and the platform of the American Capitalist Party on the very limited website, uh, <laughs> yeah. I can get behind that 100%. So what's, what's the next step? What's going on? Why aren't they doing anything? I know they need a billionaire to fund them or something, but. Yeah, <laughs> like... uh, yeah you need a billionaire. I mean, that helps. Um, I, I like Mark a lot, and I think he's right about a ton of this stuff, and I would welcome you guys to watch my interview with him. Um, I think perhaps maybe an, an easier route than, than that would be, it seems to me that the Libertarian Party at this point, which at least has the apparatus of a party, you know what I mean, they exist as a party. Uh, and they're, they're basically a bunch of clowns. I mean, unfortunately, I wish they weren't. Again, I, I wanted Gary Johnson to at least get into the, I'd love to smoke pot with the guy, but wasn't a great president. <laughs> Um, I, I actually asked him if he would smoke pot with me, but he wasn't there in the campaign. Um, <laughs> although he, he started turning me against pot, which really tells you a lot about the whole candidacy. Because I was like, this guy can't remember a freaking thing. Um, he, he, should, he should go to Aleppo. I know, I know. Um, so I would say that there could be, uh, and I've been discussing this with a couple of people, I don't want to do it, but somebody could just hijack the Libertarian Party and make it the party that you want. <laughs> And I think that that, because they exist, they're on the ballots already. And they've really unfortunately not done much with it. Uh, so I would, say, I would say that's probably the best option because creating a party and, and getting on the ballots and dealing with the, the system and never getting media coverage. The, the, look, I like Gary Johnson as a person. I will say one, one thing about him. The only time you ever heard of him was when he made a gaffe. And that's part of the problem. So in a way, it almost benefited him to say stupid things and do the tongue thing and all that, because at least somebody was talking about him. So it's a huge monster you got to fight. But I think that maybe that's the, the start of it. But I know we got a lot of people, so we'll. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, it just depends on the, I mean, some, some, I mean, in my opinion, you can hold the same values that you hold without necessarily advocating for capitalism or stuff, at least when it comes to free speech. So when it comes to libertarianism, I mean, someone does not, in my opinion, does not have to be a libertarian, at least on fully, to defend free speech. Uh, so, if, I mean, the values that we talk about, um, some of them, I think that's, I mean, for example, I'm, I am unapologetically interventionist. I support liberal interventionism. I know that some libertarians will be triggered by this, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> So I probably would try more to influence the current political parties than try to, because I think with libertarians, they, you can hardly influence them when it comes to some of the values I care about. So I think, I mean, to, to try to hijack, it depends on, again, back to the values that you care about. And I think it, uh, if try to influence both parties equally. I mean, that's, that's I think, the best way to do it. Um, I'd like to make two short points. The first is that um, I think I'd like to agree with the point you made earlier, and that was that the the right-left narrative is fundamentally flawed. Um, and I, I, one example I want to use is 
support for gay marriage. And when, when I think about my support for gay marriage, it's kind of interesting. I think about it in the form of it's not the government's role to influence what individuals do in this particular way. Um, but then if you um, see the leftist um, support for gay marriage, it's because they're a minority. It has very little to do with their fundamental belief that the government shouldn't be involved in their personal affairs in this particular way. Um, but my question is, is something that Faisal mentioned, and that was that um, when you're called a racist, when you're called a homophobe, when um, these things are posed towards you, you should challenge their idea. You should um, see why they think that way. I guess one problem I see is that you're trying to be rational and reason with someone who is fundamentally irrational and unreasonable. Um, they're not looking to have a rational debate with you. They're not looking to understand your ideas. So how do you, how do you defend free speech? From a strategy, from a strategy standpoint, when someone is being fundamentally irrational towards you, or even hostile. Yeah. Let me just throw in one addition before you answer, which is, you know, we all saw this with with Sam Harris. He laid out Pew statistics, very calm things. I mean, we've gotten to know him. This is a, a very decent human being, perhaps the most decent human being that I know. Uh, but he's dealing with irrational people, which is exactly what your question is. Can you actually rationalize? Because that was sort of all of our answer, but maybe it isn't the right answer. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it depends how dogmatic they are. I mean, I think there is a term a friend of mine, Michael, I think you probably know him, he coined the term regressive leaning. Is that those who may believe some regressive ideas, but at the same time, they are open to dialogue. I mean, so some people, like, I mean, I mean that's where the, sometimes these terms matter so much, is that, I mean, if someone is really racist, it is difficult to have a conversation with them. So if they label you as a racist, then they assume already that they cannot have a conversation with you because you are a, you are a racist. So, I, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, hopefully, I mean, I, I hope I'm right in this, is that more people are willing to change their minds than they are dogmatic. And I think that, and I, I can speak from also the fact that if Saudis, if many Saudis are able to change their mind, I think there is still hope for America. I mean, <laughs> that's because uh, based upon the upbringing that they have had and, and all the living under a closed society and a theocracy, if they're able, if some of them are able to change their mind, I think that many of those within American left or right are probably more open. It, it depends on how you have a conversation with them. I think that, I mean, there are multiple ways of having a conversation. And I think that if they're going to, I think that the attack and calling people idiots and stuff in person is not going to be helpful to your conversation. I think that if you uh, acknowledge, you tell them like, oh, you support gay rights, I support them too. Oh, there's, there's the logic that I follow versus like, oh, you are a collectivist, moron, idiot. Like, that's not going to, I, I think in my opinion, is not going to help. And the same, I mean, the same argument can be had for religious people. I mean, we have with us Matt Dillahunty who... Uh, spends a lot of time making videos talking about Christianity and stuff. And I think he's very respectful, and I'm sure that he was able to change a lot of minds. So I think that um, this kind of approach is probably the most beneficial approach versus personal attacks and ad hominems. That's and maybe do as much of it in person as you can, yeah. because people are much worse online. Uh, you know, dealing with a Twitter egg, or now they're just a head with a thing or something. But that, they're always worse in, in that regard. Can I, can I just add yeah. one thing, one quick thing to that? So um, I agree with what Faisal said. Um, first thing, make sure they really are irrational. Don't just write them off because they have different views. And, and check your own thinking and how you come across, because you can really come across as though you're just berating them. Um, second thing, if they really are irrational, the only time to waste time speaking to an irrational person is if you have an audience and you're trying to demonstrate something to the audience. Hi. Hi, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for coming here. Mark, I've, I've seen clips of your show and I've really enjoyed watching them and, and I really enjoyed hearing from uh, uh, the other two uh, gentlemen here as well. Um, and uh, I actually saw uh, the president, uh, the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute speak last night at College Republicans, uh, Aaron Brook, and, and I really enjoyed listening to what he had to say about the morality of, of capitalism. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jay Crosby. I'm a student at UT School of Public Health. I know we've been talking a lot about uh, free speech and, and censorship of ideas. I just want to bring up a, a, not a controversial point that I um, uh, that wasn't uh, brought up here, and, and that issue is I. Another really, which has been very controversial, is uh, uh, I know firsthand as a school of public health is um, uh, 
the topic of uh, vaccination safety. And I understand that, um, I understand the people not really familiar with that issue, you know, the, the, the natural instinct even for a very intelligent person is um, listen to your doctor, speak to your doctor. Um, but there is, a, there is kind of a conflicting issue here, which is that if a child gets injured or a patient gets injured by a vaccine, they cannot sue the doctor. They cannot sue the drug company. They sue the government. And at the same time, the, uh, however, if the doctor doesn't uphold vaccine policy, uh, state vaccination policy, they could, um, as has happened in California, uh, get in trouble with their state medical board for not upholding state policy. So um, I just really what my, my question is or, or my concern is, is that is it necessary just to listen to what the to defer to what the majority of doctors uh, think or at least say when there appears to be this sort of there appears to be this issue here where doctors are there's this appears to be too much government interference that's not actually allowing uh, doctors to um, be upfront uh, about this. I, well, I can give you, uh, my, my quick answer would be that yeah. I would say it would be the same thing if we were talking about climate change, right. which is that I'm not a scientist, right. so, I don't understand. so that I have to trust what the majority of climate scientists say. So th that may not be that uh, rewarding of an answer, but I, I don't know that there's a better way to, to handle it as we're not public policy. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would either. say is uh, truth is not decided by majorities of anything. Um, but that's it. I mean, you can, you can glean, so even as a non-scientist, you can tell there are certain, you, there's a way to approach this in a rational way. I, I'm not going to try to go through it here, but there are certain things you can understand. Then you can talk to experts. Um, by the way, I'm pro-vaccine, as pro-vaccine as you can be, and I think that a lot of the anti-vaccine people are just, they're off the rockers and they're not paying attention to science. Now, um, now that doesn't mean that, that every reason for, for that, like, everything that they think is wrong. And part of what you pointed to is there's this mixing of government and science. Anytime you mix government with anything that government shouldn't be involved in, certainly government and knowledge, you end up screwing up knowledge. And, and because people have all kinds of reasons, their, their interests clash, they're, they're suspicious about government forcing them to do things that they don't want to do. Freedom always is the better option. But let me keep it at that because it's a really complicated issue. Yeah, I'm pro vaccines too. <laughs> <laughs> quick answer. Hey guys, thanks so much for coming. Uh, one quick comment, one quick question. Um, Steve, I really appreciated the way you talked about, in essence, speaking truth to power, be able to, to make your voice heard. And if I saw for you, it was the concept of the preciousness of humanity. Uh, Dave, I've come to know your videos and I would rate them as groovy rationalism. Like it's, let's get together and, and, and sit put down. Put that on a card. And I then like that. Like royalties, that. capitalism. No, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is, uh, my, to my question part, um, we've recognized through social media that there has been uh, cases of bullying leading to suicide. And my question, as abstract as it may seem, is do you see moving forward with groups like Antifa all the way through ISIS? you have made uh, yourselves on the internet. It is, it is ingrained in our society. Is there a weaponization we can look at for these organizations using these outlets? If we can be pushed for young children to be bullied to a point of committing suicide, can we, can we X factor that out and think about perhaps this weaponization? Is this something to be mindful of? Well, so your question is, can we figure out an antidote, basically? I mean, what's the, what's the end factor? What's sure. The, I mean, is this, is this another channel? I mean, we're talking, in essence, from free speech perspective, we're talking about the, you know, shutting down people, you know, on your business side. You know, yeah. if we can control and regulate this, it can therefore be weaponized. Yeah, well, I think one good example, like when you see things that are clearly what they are, then you have to call them out for that. So I had uh, Tim Poole, who's a interesting, a, a really good independent journalist on my show on Monday, and he was at Berkeley. And look, at Berkeley, even though the media framed it as it was these Trump supporters fighting these Antifa people, it really was free speech people versus a bunch of people that look like soldiers from Cobra and G.I. Joe. So you can figure out who the good guys are in that case pretty quickly. You know what I mean? Destro's in the back. Like, you can figure out what's happening there. <laughs> Destro, did I? All right, one guy, Destro, OK. I got um, it. If it's you got it? All right, good. Um, so I think that that 
we have to call this out. Uh, look, they're, they call themselves Antifa, and they're using the tactics of fascism, violence, to stop other people from speaking and to promote their ideas. So we have to consistently call these people out. And you may be frustrated uh, with whatever's going on in the government or whatever's going on with, with your job, uh, but that's not an excuse to, to be like, ah, you know, maybe we'll let a little violence with these guys go because, you know, these, they got some decent ideas. We just have to, I think it's a theme that we've had here. We have to just stop saying it's okay to chip away a little more at society and a little more at society. It just has to stop. Yeah. Can I just add one thing to that? So, um, uh, the, I don't think social media changes the fact that a criminal enterprise is a criminal enterprise, whether they're doing it in the old fashioned way, you know, gathering together in some basement, or, uh, or in the new fashioned way on social media. We have to understand that if they're advocating violence and they're taking steps toward violence or the violation of rights, they're a criminal enterprise. ISIS clearly is, right? So they should be prosecuted. Um, and, but I would also say, Dave raised Antifa. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I would say Antifa is a criminal organization, but they definitely engaged in criminal, cons criminal conspiracies. I mean, the, the, if you read about what happened to Heather McDonald at Claremont McKenna, uh, and whether this was Antifa or just a student group, there was a, they planned to form a human chain around that uh, building and, quote, shut it down. They did it on Facebook. That's called a criminal conspiracy to violate the rights of certainly the university. It's an arrestable offense. They should be arrested. In other words, we have to really take that seriously. You can't say, oh, we'll start taking it seriously when it just gets bad. You've got to take it seriously every single time. Um, and, and if college administrators had any courage, they would be going after people who are violating the law as though they're criminals because they are criminals. In terms of the bullying issue, that's a harder issue. I tend to think, without having spent a ton of thought of it, that there is room for some sort of a kind of harassment crime or something like that by using social media, but I haven't worked out all the details. But it's a concern that I think law enforcement and, and you know, prosecutors and those kinds of people should be looking at and thinking hard about, you know, is there a role for law enforcement? Sure. And that's all I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, what I can add to this, but uh, I mean, Winston Churchill once said, like, the future movement of anti-fascism will, will become called anti-fascism. So, I mean, I, I really I don't have anything to add. I mean, these people seem to be more expert than, than I, I do. I appreciate it, yeah. And my, and my second point really is just to say, kind of listening tonight, um, I would say, uh, I'm proudly Catholic, and we just, you know, of course, celebrating Easter. Um, I would say that some of the things you guys are talking about, whether they, the ideolo ideologies from, you know, either capitalism or, or nationalism or colonialism, any, any perspective, I would say, I think I've tried to seek comfort in my own life, finding things like justice, as you were saying, Dave, or humanity, uh, if I saw, and, and in Dave, that grooviness to get together and, you know, love one another. Um, and I, I think, I, I would hope that, that as, as someone of faith, that I would, I would bring an open-mindedness in my argument to everyone. Um, that, and, and if I fall short of that, please hold me accountable, guys. Um, that, that does drive me at the bottom core, at, at, at my core. Um, and I think that's an important part that we can maybe possibly embrace. Um, and I just thought that could, that could be said. Thanks. Give it up for that guy, for being honest and real. Thank you for that. Hi, Hi. thank you uh, three gentlemen for coming out, enlightening our minds and whatnot. Um, I just want to start by saying as a Christian, all the secular talk has really triggered me personally. <laughs> so I just wanted to get that off my chest. Um, but no, really, I did want to actually ask, um, so there's a lot of talk about human rights. Uh, I've very much like the idea of our constitution, how it protects these rights that I do believe are inalienable. Um, can't say that word right, inalienable. And that we have to our core. So I just wanted to hear kind of from the secular view, because I have my view as being created in the image of God, why we have certain inalienable rights. So why from a secular view do we have these rights? How do you, how do you justify that? And also what constitutes as a right versus what, you know, some things we're talking about now are things like healthcare and some people think that is a right. Some people disagree, don't think that's a right. So how do we figure this, or how do you, how do, rather, how do you three uh, gentlemen approach that question? Yeah, that's another great question. Why don't you, as the one that wasn't born here, take that Yeah, first. I mean, I, I see it from, I, I kind of apply more of a utilitarian consequentialist approach in which, uh, which kind of values that in increases a human well-being and which kind of values that reduces a human well-being. So I look at the value not from up down, but rather from bottom up, is that 
what, what type of, of ideas, I mean, that increases human flourishing. So let's say, uh, I don't know, like killing, I mean, not allowing women to drive, for example. What makes, what makes this uh, concept wrong? Because it's wrong because it increases human suffering. You are allowing 50% of the population not ability to transport and go from pla one place to other, and maybe they will be harmed by this. So this kind of approach that I follow. And me personally, I mean, I, I mean not to be argumentative with you, but I don't think, I mean, religion is in general bad morality, in my opinion, at least the Abrahamic ones. I mean, the other is like, what makes, when, when it comes to religion, what makes things right is not whether they actually increase human suffering, it's increase human happiness or suffering, or reduce human suffering. It's more like uh, God told you to do so. And that is, and you're not allowed to question it to begin with. So, and to, to question it is to go to hell. So he created kind of a system in which you cannot even question why religious morality is even moral because it's coming from God and you cannot question God. So, um, I, so I, I don't personally think that there could be a rational source of morality with religion. Not, not that I want to argue with you. Not that I sound, sound like a strident uh, and atheist, but I think that... Um, You're not going to throw him off a roof or something? No, not, not tonight. Not tonight. Yeah, but uh, I think that this is, this is the way that I see that the only way to find actual real morality is actually to look at what, how can we increase human well-being in society. Uh, real quick, th this is somewhere that uh, Faisal and I don't see totally eye to eye on this. I I'm not a believer myself, but I say on the show all the time, I, I have many friends and family members that are believers. I have no problem what anyone believes as long as the laws that we're governed by are the laws that were supposed to be governed by the Constitution. Now we got all kinds of problems with that at the moment and we're, you know, we've been giving power over to the executive branch too much and, and all sorts of that. So I would say the, the one answer for me with this would be that we need to be governed the way we're supposed to be governed. We're supposed to have three branches of government that without getting into, you know, uh, Politics 101 here. We're supposed to have a legislative branch that writes laws. We're supposed to have an executive branch that signs them into law and a judicial branch that makes sure that they're actually legal. If we could stick to that and have the separation of powers and have the checks and balances that we're supposed to have, whether you're a believer or a non-believer or where do rights come from or does it have to do with God or does it not have to do with God, I think those things would all be ancillary things that wouldn't be that important and you could live your life in any way. Yeah, so um, uh, let me preface what I'm going to say by saying my view on religion is not that everybody who's religious is a bloodthirsty lunatic. That's not the, the no. view. I want to make that clear. And, and, and I believe wholeheartedly in freedom of religion. I think religion is fundamentally irrational. I think it's bad for you. But, and there's all kinds of arguments we can make about that. But I just want to get that out there. My point is not like, oh, anybody who's religious is a total lunatic. That's not the issue. Yeah. And, and, and part of what enforcing and, and, uh, and respecting rights means is it's the right to think for yourself, which means if you want to be religious, absolutely, you get to be religious, as long as you don't violate the rights of other people. But let me swing back and give the really, as quickly as I can, objectivist view of rights, which is purely secular. It's basically this. Human beings have to live in a certain way to survive, right? We can go out of existence. If we take the wrong set of actions, we cease to exist. If we take the right set of actions, we continue our life. The fundamental thing that we have to do to live is we have to think, right? We have to use our minds. And we have to be free to both think and reach the conclusions that we're, and understand reality and reach true conclusions. And we have to be able to take actions um, toward to sustain, sustain our lives. So the, the essential is we have to create the stuff that sustains our lives and we need freedom of action to do that. That leads inexorably, I think, to the concept or the need for a concept of rights. How do we figure out where my freedom of action ends and yours begins? We need a concept of rights and rights ultimately say you have a sphere of freedom within which to act and there's one thing you can't do, and that is you can't use or initiate force against other people because force, criminality, you know, bashing you on the head with a stick prevents you from taking the actions necessary to sustain and live your life. Now, there's a whole lot more to say about it than that, but that's the basic essence. That's the secular you know, derivation of rights. It's based on the type of organisms we are and what we need to do to survive. And then I think the founders, John Locke, a lot of thinkers have developed this concept. I think there's some flaws in what they've uh, done. But I mean, ultimately, to, to pick your, your concrete example of healthcare, 
Healthcare, you, the first question to ask, did we have a right to healthcare, is well, who's paying for the healthcare? And the answer is, well, either all of us or doctors, and who, where the hell do you get off demanding that I pay for your healthcare? Or, that, or ultimately demanding that a doctor work for you ultimately for free. I mean, there's another word for that. It's slavery if you take it to its logical end. Uh, and, and I mean, it's crazy to think that like you have a right to the labor and the income of other people. That's, that makes no sense. That is the essence of communism. Um, so, so when we think about rights, it has to be, uh, each of us has to the right to think, act, and create. And then we can trade with, with one another, but we have to be free to do that. That's where rights come in. But it's a real good question. Absolutely, thank you so much. All right, so Faisal, first off, from one brown atheist to another, <laughs> Faisal Hu Akbar. <laughs> with that out of the way, um, my, my uh, question is, how do we measure our progress in promoting, um, for example, as you said, kind of ditching the left-right dichotomy and um, you know, moving forward and basing our, I guess for lack of a better word, lifestyle off of ideas rather than political alignment or religion, how do we in some concrete way measure that? You know, for example, like this is something I've asked um, for uh, like to Black Lives Matter activists, for example, I've asked them, you know, how do we concretely measure change? So that's something I wanted to ask you guys. At what point do we say, okay, we've achieved our goal? I think it's a great question. Let me, I'll just throw in one thing real yeah. quick that you could look at gay rights and the, the, the progressives did, I don't give them a lot of credit, but they did do something here. They led the charge on that. Ultimately, it was done by the Supreme Court. But what's interesting is when, you, when something good happens, you have to acknowledge that you moved your opponents. The country moved. There's nobody fighting against gay marriage anymore. There are, you know, yes, of course, there are some people that, that aren't for it. Okay, so be it. I, I wish they were. I don't think that screaming that they're homophobes is gonna trick them into suddenly be, I think you can show them, oh, your, your cousin's gay or that person's gay and, and so be it. Um, but I think the best answer to your question is that acknowledge when, when, you make, when you get a win. When you get a win, acknowledge that the other side moved and showed some elasticity in their thinking. I think that that kind of humbleness will ingratiate uh, you to them. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think that, uh, like, to, I think that somehow, it's, for me, it's, it is a numbers game. I think that the more our ideas seem to be followed by more people, I mean, the more people send us emails and we can see that, uh, not necessarily emails, but hopefully a membership organization that generates membership, um, and we see these ideas being applied in which there are less speakers being deplatformed, uh, less of these UC Berkeley kind of events of uh, Starbucks getting, I mean, more, less of these events appearing, I see that as a measure of change. I mean, you, you see what is bad happening when you don't see it more happening. I think that's the way we can see whether things are changing toward direction. Uh, and the more you see human rights are respected around the world, mostly for my case, Islamic societies, and seeing that uh, in Saudi Arabia, having women having the right to drive, uh, blasphemers in Bangladesh will not get beheaded for being secular, uh, Pakistani activists are not being killed by the government or kidnapped by the government. This is, I think, is a way of measuring the, that we're actually getting something, getting stuff done. I'll just add one really quick uh, thought. When, when, there can be a pro, when there can be a talk on campus on a controversial subject and nobody protests, instead they just go in and they decide, hey, why don't we listen to this and then we can ask hard questions of the person. That'll be a measure of giant progress. But that's just one random thing that occurs to me. The whole idea that, that, that there are protests of everybody in the world constantly, that there was even a protest at Heather McDonald's talk at Claremont McKenna, I think is completely insane. Yeah, or yeah, if, somebody's speaking, if somebody's speaking at a university, you're like, go get laid. Are people still doing that? <laughs> have, have you guys done that? It's good. I mean, try it. No, all men are rapists. <laughs> just, just a second. Just a second. <laughs> Hey, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciated the talk. Um, my question is, it's one that I get a lot also, is do you see any value in a speaker like Milo who fights for free speech but does so in a way that is controversial on purpose to, to gain ratings and is inflammatory just 
for the sake of being inflammatory to build its own image? Should I go first? Um, um, I mean, you, you know him much better than I do. Yeah, well, look, I, I like Milo, and, he, and he's a friend of mine, and I've had him on the show a bunch. We disagree on, on a ton of stuff, most specifically that he refuses to make the distinction between the doctrine of Islam and, and Muslims as people, as Faisal laid out already. Um, I, but I do see a value in, in, uh, in what he does, that you know, not everybody is gonna do what you guys did here today. Not everybody's gonna listen to an hour-long talk and, and a measured response to uh, really to think out things and, and use your logic and use your mind. So when he does things that are over the top, sometimes it, I, and I've seen this, I know this, because I went to UCLA with him and I saw him say crazy things and you know, people were screaming and it was like a WWF event. But after, but the truth is that after, kids were coming up to me and saying, you know, Dave, Milo brought me here, but I really like what you do. You know, and that shows me something, that we need sometimes those, those flamethrowers to just throw it out there, break things up a little bit, and then, and then find some other answers. So yes, it, there's a cost to it. it I, don't, I, I don't wanna judge him personally, but is he doing some of it for, for clicks and, and views and all that? that? That's up for anyone to decide. Um, but I do think there's a value in it, and I think society needs provocateurs, and, and if we didn't have it, I mean, we'd be in a worse society, because sometimes you need to move the ball in that way. Yeah, I, I think that's true. All I'll say about it is, I'll, I'll use a terrible mixed metaphor here. Um, uh, he's kind of a cultural barometer, and when it gets cold out, you don't get mad and break the thermometer. There's the mixing of the two, because I don't know what the hell a barometer is supposed to do, so I have to switch to thermometer. But, but I mean, there is something to the idea that you need a guy like Milo, even I have real questions about him, and I don't know him as well as Dave does, so I've learned more about him because of Dave. But I think it's, in some sense, good to have a guy like out, who's out there who's willing to kind of stir things up. Let's put it this way real quick. You know, if Milo did all the stuff that he does and no protesters showed up and nobody burned down Berkeley or did any of this stuff, yeah. well, then he'll stop coming. You know what I mean? It really, it really is as simple as that. If, if what you think is that he wants attention, stop giving him attention. But they keep falling in the trap over and over again. Yeah. You know, he's not going to be happy that I'm telling you this, but there you go. Yeah. What's that? He's trying to take the heat from the more reasonable people. In a certain regard, yeah. in a certain regard, I think that's fair. I mean, just to add to that, I mean, yeah, how to, how to stop people like Milo from being successful? Just don't attend their events. That's it. Make them fail. That's what you should do. I mean, Milo came to, I live in New York, and Milo came to New York multiple times. I never went, because I just want him to fail. I mean, that's, that's, that's the free market way of allowing things to fail. I mean, if there is any several lining to have with Milo, I think he is making us look good, right? So now we're no longer the insane people. So that's, that's the way I see it, is that because he's so provocative and, and he says so much bullshit, right? We are like everyone, like after, if, if somebody, if Milo speaks, then I come in. And people are like, wow, Faisal looks like a moderate here. <laughs> so I, I think if there is any silver lining to be had with Milo is that he makes us look better. And, but at the same time, I still want him to fail. So it's kind of, I, it's, it's kind of a cognitive business that I have. On one side, I think he's lowering the standard. Like, just, just look at the Republican Party for a bit. Like, there are now people who miss George W. Bush, right? Yeah. And things were, were like, Bush was an intelligent guy. Well, yeah, because we have Trump now, right? So we have the standards are getting lower to the way that Bush looks like a, like a scientist. So... <laughs> So the, the same thing now like happening with the far left and when you, well, people who also like hold, want to deplatform people and stuff. So now even like Noam Chomsky said a quote about defending a free speech and I was like, wow, Noam Chomsky, seems like a moderate guy. And like, so, so I think that, yeah, if there is any silver lining to be had with Milo, I think he's just lowering the standards of how to be acceptable. Awesome, and also I want to say my first like introduction to politics was watching Milo on your show, actually. One of the- I Well, think then the, I think you answered your own thing. Yeah, then. so yeah. it was- it was good to get me in the door, at least. So I thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find very interesting about the left is that in the 60s, they were, you know, wanting to have free love and, you know, have sex on the campus. And now they're the biggest prudes in America. Uh, you know, the only, the only time they're in favor of heterosexual sex is when it's a movie director having sex with a teenager. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a, uh, I mean, what happened there? And, you know, I really think that in about 20, 30 years, men are just going to snap 
and get so fed up with all this crap because, I mean, you know, there was a guy in England or England who was arrested because he was a widower and he was traveling with his teenage or he wasn't arrested, but they called the police because he was a widower and had his teenage daughter with him because they thought he was, you know, doing something inappropriate. I mean, what are we going to do about this war on men and this war on heterosexual men, especially? Well, as one of the commanders in the war, I, uh, <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't even know what that meant. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm not sure there is such a war to begin with, but, but I, um, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you are sane. Um, is that, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there is, I mean, there is this, I mean, there's this kind of claim made. I mean, there are some, I mean, to be honest, I, there are some claims made by the men's rights movement that I think some make sense when it comes to like divorce and things like that. But I think when it comes to the world in general, heterosexual men seem to have it pretty good most of the time. Um, compared to homosexuals in most of the Muslim world and the trans people and stuff, I think straight males pretty have it good. I, I mean, if there is one privilege that I have is that I'm a straight male. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, well, I, I in would those say... societies too, they, they have enough people to reproduce, which is not the case in all these feminist societies. I, I would say check out, if you want more about this, check out an interview I did with, um, uh, who's the girl from Red Pill? I'm blanking on her name, sorry. Cassie J, uh, Cassie J thanks. Uh, and, we, and we go pretty deep into this. And she did a documentary all about this, so I would say uh, check that out. But, but just that, I mean, there are seven billion people on this planet. Why do we need to reproduce anyway? So I think that, uh, I mean, isn't it enough we have seven billion on this planet? I think that maybe we need more feminist societies to reduce reproduction, not increase it. I think that, don't you think that seven billion people is more than enough? Like, just imagine this. And half of them are probably idiots. So like, what the hell? Like, the, the, the less we pr reproduce, the better, I think. Reminder, everybody, Milo makes him look sane. So there you go. So, so thanks, gentlemen. I'll do what I can to, to keep this short, although Dave said something I disagreed with right when oh, I was standing in line. Uh, the difference, and I, and I don't think we disagree that much, is that I actually do care what people believe in the privacy of their own home because those beliefs inform actions, including how they vote and how they legislate once we elect them. So I care about getting to that. So I've kind of pretty much dedicated my entire life to this process of finding ways to change minds including my own. And a number of mistakes have been made, as anybody who's seen the shows and debates have, can attest to. I would say we're probably just splitting hairs there. Yeah. What I mean, if they're going to put it into action and then vote yes. on those things, then of course I have yeah. a problem with it. See, I told you we didn't there disagree that much. All right. So in the process of trying to change minds, one of the things that, that's come up that I've learned over the years that was incredibly frustrating is that we constantly assume that because we are using the same words, we mean the same thing. And this isn't just a problem with labels. It's a problem, no offense, but I, I think happened tonight on a number of occasions where we, so for example, with free speech, there's the connotation of free speech with regard to what you can legally say. And then there's a connotation of free speech with what you're gonna allow on campus or in your living room or what we should permit or how we should react to those. In the conversations, I've had difficulty getting people to care about what the truth is. But I wanted to know if you guys had thoughts, not just about how you get people to care about truth, because I don't think that there's that many who are immune to reason so much as they've been convinced by bad reasons. And if you get them to recognize this, you can have an impact. But how do we encourage people and what do we, what, 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 I mean, what, might we have public speaker doing great? What might we change about education and other things where now we're not only encouraging people to care about the truth, but to care enough about the conversations that are likely to lead to truth, that they're willing to take the time to make sure that they've defined terms and are talking about the same thing rather than talking past each other? That's a great question. Um, I mean, uh, a, a few thoughts off the top of my head. Education is a huge subject, and I don't know enough about it to really speak intelligently to it. And there's a whole movement out there, the Montessori movement, all kinds of different movements toward educating kids in the way that you're thinking, I think you're, you're getting to, how to think, basically, and how to really form concepts that are really grounded in the real world. But the one thing I would say is we do have to challenge the loose usage of terminology both. So your, your, your example of free speech, uh, First Amendment rights, the right to free speech versus all kinds of other ways, it's a term that's used too loosely. And sometimes I even do it, and I shouldn't do it as a guy who's, you know, who knows what he's talking about. Um, and we have to be really clear about you know, when do you have a right to free speech versus when are you attacking something like the value of open inquiry, which are two different things. Um, uh, so let's take a term like Islamophobia. 
So I think one of the things we can do is attack the terminology that is used by people who are essentially engaging in fuzzy thinking and just glossing over. You can read whole screeds that don't make any sense from top to bottom because they use all kinds of terms that are loaded that have no definitions whatsoever. And Islamophobia is a good example of that because it's worse than a meaningless term. It's a term that prevents people from thinking intelligently about an issue that they have to think about. I think it was designed to do that. So one of the things people can do to try to reach other people is to question, what do you mean by Islamophobia? Wait a minute, religion is a body of ideas. As such, it motivates behavior. Its own adherents use it as a guide to behavior. How can it be that I can't criticize Islam. That doesn't make any sense. And likewise, objectivism or you know, any sort of philosophy, there are bodies of ideas. They lead people to think things. And so that's how I think you have to try to reach people who are reachable, is to try to, try to test their thinking about this and say, what do you mean by that? I don't even understand that term and what it means. And let's try to get to a point where we can actually agree on you know, what the terms mean. And only then can we actually have a conversation. Yeah, I would say real quick, uh, check out my, if you didn't see it, my interview with Eric Weinstein, who's a, a world famous mathematician, and he talked a lot about this, that we're not using the words the same way, so half the time you think we're talking about the same thing and we're talking about two completely different things. I would say the only way that I've figured out anything that's true over the last couple of years is by sitting down with people that think different things. And often I find it's not the people that I'm agreeing with that I'm learning from, it's the people that I disagree with, because if you let people talk, and they, and they don't know what they're saying, or it's not true, and it's not right, every time you will watch them hang themselves. And it's like slow motion, and it's a beautiful thing. And, and then you'll figure out what, what you believe. We do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know who you are. Well, I, we've never done this in more than 140 I'll, I'll characters. I'll show you some good margaritas is, tonight, yeah. I guess. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, great. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, one more. By the way, congratulations for winning the game tonight. <laughs> Uh, against Bayern Munich, so congratulations. Yeah. Even though I'm a Bayern fan, but you guys. Uh, I would like to have him have the last question. Uh, he seems like he really wants to do it. All right. who's, who's got the good one? You, uh, you got a good one? Um, yeah, I just. Who has the best question? I have a question? lot of things to say about in our quest to thwart the Commune Islamic Alliance. Um, and. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. The, I think. I think Matt said a lot. That would have been a way to end the show. But we really need to define our terms uh, precisely so that we can, if we encounter new political or social movements like people like Antifa resisting free speech, you're having trouble defining that earlier. I would, I would say I'd call them Liberphobes. They're 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 screaming at people. <laughs> they're they're like Liberphobic racists. Like they're. they're Screaming re people. Um, oh, re. Uh, re. Re. <laughs> the re yeah, yeah, yeah. Re, um, get it? Guys, that's a frog thing, If for those of you. Uh, really? Yeah, I, I got it. I, I don't know. I'm not so much about the frog, but um, wow. I'm. All right, I, you make a good point, but we're going to finish with this guy right here, <laughs> who I think is going to bring it home, sir. I hope you're are right. you Are you Ken Ham? Are you Ken Ham? No, I'm just kidding. Oh my God, no. <laughs> oh, why would you do that? We're trying to end up, all right, what do you got for us? Big, big finish. The, the ref takes a point on that one. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm probably the only person who doesn't think the two-party system is a problem. I think the one solution system is a problem. And with more than one solution available, it's basically federalism, right? So my solution is maybe we should automate the Congress and move that stuff around, get rid of the choke point for all of the money and all the decisions that we should be making that somebody else's. And 21st century, we don't need representation anymore. So what do you think? Do you think people could make that kind of mental transition to do it yourself? So basically outsource government to Amazon, I think is, I think is no, pretty to your, much. To yourself. Yeah. Self-representation, essentially just click your way through, put your money where you want it to go. You don't want it to go to a war, it doesn't. It goes a little, it, I just, it seems like a more intelligent solution and the technology exists now to do it. It would sound complicated, but in reality, it looks like the Berlin Wall. So what, what, what do you think people could make that intelligent transition, or do you think it's just, nope? The system's pretty ingrained, but Steve, I'm going to kick that to you. <laughs> I knew you would. Um, I mean, the, if you're talking about outright no government whatsoever, no, I don't think that could work. You have to have some government. 
All I'll say is this, uh, I, I, I'm gonna put in a plug for Ayn Rand here. She wrote a really fascinating uh, essay uh, called, Go uh, I think it's Government Financing in a Free Society in which she has some really radical and fascinating ideas about that, just that kind of thing that you're talking about. It's not no two-party system. It doesn't really have to do with the structure of government, but it does have to do with the idea that if, if, uh, if you didn't want to finance a war, you wouldn't finance a war, that kind of thing. I recommend the essay. Um, it's a long, we're a long way off from that. So, uh, I mean, I think what we need to do today is fix people's thinking about the system that we have today and then worry about you know, system, uh, uh, solutions that aren't gonna happen for centuries you know, in centuries. Well, the blockchain kind of allows a lot of open-ended open transacting, so we could put a lot of stuff on there and it would be done in the open instead of behind closed doors. It would solve a lot of the corruption problems anyway. I think it'd be hard to implement now, but it's yeah, an man, interesting uh, idea. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out and expressing your right to free speech while you still got it.